started in 2021. This series started in 2021 with six institutes of directors, the Institute of Directors of Hong Kong, New Zealand, South Africa, Mauritius, the Caribbean Corporate Governance Institute, and the GCC Board Directors Institute, grouping together to discuss an important topic that is dear to our hearts and has been a crucial topic of discussion in the corporate world, be it for investors looking to invest in companies, governments looking to attract more foreign direct investment into their economies, or organizations going through their ESG journey to become more sustainable. And of course, that topic is diversity and inclusion, and particularly women on boards. Progression of women in boardrooms is slow, but in motion. In 2022, the percentage of women on Fortune 500 boards has risen by almost 30%. However, findings by the Harvard Business Review indicated that women were labeled as cold or incompetent and received negative backlash when speaking their mind, lessening their influence on any board decision making. So in today's session, we're going to look at the current challenges women directors face on boards, positioning women leaders and strategies to differentiate them from other directors on the board, navigating with the right tools and tactics to influence the decision making process in a boardroom. Before proceeding with the agenda, I'd like now to invite my co-conspirator, on today's seminar, Kamla Rampasad de Silva, CEO of the Caribbean Corporate Governance Institute, to say a few words. Kamla, over to you. Thank you so much, Jane. I, I, you know, I want to share, I am so happy to be living in this century, in this specific time and in this place. This Sunday, I took a plunge into the deep waters of one of our most cherished bays in Trinidad and Tobago. It was 6 a.m., the waters were calm and clear, and it was exhilarating. These experiences I know are not to be taken for granted. Then, not when we look at the past where we were chattels to men and not allowed to have such freedoms. We were not allowed to choose who we marry, much less have the privilege to own property and work in business. Similarly, as we look to the future, we can see many challenges looming. The intense heat waves in many countries leading to disruption of people's lives warns of further impending danger as we grapple with the complexities of activities contributing to the deterioration of the environment and worsening climate change. <clears throat> Will the shoulders of women have to carry, <clears throat> excuse me, let me ask that question again. Will the shoulders of women have to carry a disproportionate share of the burden? And let us not forget the geopolitical changes that have loomed. The Russian-Ukraine war of the last year has put the world on edge as the prospect of an entire new world order is not far-fetched. The future, more so now than ever, is difficult to predict. As women today, many of us are able to enjoy freedoms that were not easily won. We are thankful to those early pioneers and understand that this is our turn to do what we can to build better lives for women in future generations. We must do as has happened here, gather and challenge the issues that face us. Whether it be the right to make our own choices for our lives or to strategize for continued recognition of our worth, whether in the world of work, in sport or in the household. I am proud to have been able to meet and collaborate with these wonderful women who lead their, their respective governance institutes. So thank you, Jane. And Kirsten and Pami, Sheila and Kali. Each of these women have been trailblazers in their own fields. And I have loved getting to know them and to work with them again in this, our second governance series together as Jane has shared. Over the course of these three days, I know we will find value in the discussions and be able to apply learnings to our own lives. I expect the same for our participants, whether you are a woman or someone who loves them. I hope we'll be able to look into the future with optimism as we are now in a time more nuanced and progressive than ever, open to debate and discussion to help solidify a woman's role in the evolving world economy. And let us remember to enjoy today to remind ourselves of how far we have progressed and confident that we're doing our part to build a better future. Thank you, Jane. 
Thank you, Kamala, for those great words. And um, we've got an exciting agenda for you today and some more great speakers and panelists. So after these introductory remarks, we're going to go into a presentation or a talk by Khlud Aldukhel, who's the CEO of Ateca Financial Company. And there'll be a Q&A after that. And then we're going to go into a joint panel discussion. We've got Francesca Gori, who's the managing director and the regional legal lead, Asia Pacific, Latin America, Middle East and Africa for Accenture as our moderator. Um, and on her panel, she's got Matt, Dr. Mariam Ficocello, Dr. Ebtisam el Taneji, and Abdul Latif al Othman, and Mina Israel, and last but by no means least, Rowena Elliott. Again, there's going to be a Q&A after that panel discussion, and then we're going to enjoy another presentation, this time by Sharon Christopher, leadership development coach and a motivational speaker and an attorney at law um, with a powerful voice I know um, based in Trinidad and Tobago. And again, we'll have some Q&A and then some closing remarks again. So um, before we start, just a few rules of engagement here. Number one rule, always please engage. Um, I think you can do that by sending questions on the chat um, or by sending us questions uh, through the through the, the question system if there is one. Um, we are recording this session, so you will get a copy of it afterwards. And um, do keep your microphone off um, unless you're presenting, so we can avoid the background noise. Keep your videos on. And number last but not by no means least, uh, please enjoy. We're going to have a great session today, and I'm sure we're all going to learn a lot. So um, without more ado, I would like to invite Khlud Aldukhel, um, she's the CEO of Ateca Financial Company, to talk to us now about how to maximize opportunities in a fast-paced environment, particularly when it comes to diversity. And these environments which we're seeing today, these new environments of tech, tourism, et cetera, what are the trends that we're seeing, particularly in Saudi Arabia where Khlud is based, to promote more women in senior roles, and what are the opportunities that are being created from initiatives which governments are, put, uh, governments are putting in place? To introduce Khlud, she has 20 years of financial advisory and investment banking experience in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. She's currently the CEO, as I mentioned, of Ateca Financial Company. She was the former managing director of Al Dukhail Financial Group. She holds many titles across various industries, and to name a few, She's chairman of the National Committee for the Financial Sector and Insurance at the Federation of Saudi Chambers. She's a member of the board and member of the Investment Committee and chairman of the Audit Committee for the Riyadh, Ch the Riyadh Chamber of Commerce. And she's a member of the board of Tamid Fintech, chairman of the Women's Council for the Federation of Saudi Chambers as well. So Khlud, I'm really pleased that you could join us today. The floor is yours. <clears throat> Bismillah. Uh, thank you, Jane, so much. And um, first, I would like to, it's, it's such an honor to be invited to participate. And I apologize for being in the last minute, just completely overwhelmed and uh, also very excited to be part of this great um, panel. Uh, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. I, I think uh, I myself have forgot uh, the amount of trouble I'm in with all these boards, but uh, it's definitely uh, being from Saudi Arabia, I'm really privileged to go through this journey, uh, which uh, I've been speaking about for several years. Uh, I know it's not fun to speak about yourself, but uh, my personal journey, I think, exhibits uh, the changes in women empowerment in Saudi. Uh, when Noor spoke to me a while uh, ago about this series, I was very excited because it has women and governance and both of these words, uh, each one in its own is very special to me. And, uh, you know, I really jumped on this opportunity to share some of my experience, uh, not only to uh, show the world what's happening in Saudi, is uh, also because we are not independent from the world. And I think, uh, you know, sharing our experience in Saudi uh, allows us to learn from others and to create a more bigger, impactful power. Um, so just without, I, I, would, I think I would like to start, uh, I know we want to focus uh, on how uh, we, how, how can 
Of course, I want to shed some light on the journey of you know women empowerment, and then we want to end with what we where we are today in Saudi in terms of women in leadership positions and being on boards. Today, I sit on seven boards. Uh, I know you mentioned a few, uh, but um, I, I'm I've been appointed as an independent director on Arabian drilling, getting to know oil rigs and things that I have no clue about. And um, I'm on the board of uh, FinTech, uh, which is the first uh, government lending. It's uh, licensed by the central bank. Uh, it's called Tamid. I'm also on the board of uh, Kafala, which is a semi-government, well, I would say government uh, uh, body. I've been elected. This is my second term. Ironically, the first term, I was uh, an advisor with the Minister of Industry. So I was representing the ministry in Kafala, which is uh, a board for government uh, financial guarantee. The second term, uh, they re-elected me based on my own merit alone. And, you know, I, I like to think that uh, we made an impact for women. I also sit on the board of an industrial company for recycling. So I used to sit on the board of the vocational training uh, center uh, that was appointed by the government to represent the private sector. So even through the journey and the positions that I was uh, fortunate to get a chance to join, whether by appointment or election. Um, it tells a story on how uh, the Saudi society or the decision makers uh, um, really trust women or can trust women. Um, I'll go a bit, a little bit, uh, I like to uh, talk about the journey in three pillars. When I used to talk about, you know, I I, call, I, I divided it into two eras, uh, pre-vision uh, and which starts from King Abdullah in 2006. And if you ask me today as a Saudi woman, where do you think, when do you think women empowerment as we know it today started? Uh, of course, obviously, we've always been working since the 60s, but I would pick 2006 if I had to pick a date. And the reason is this is the year that a royal decree by King Abdullah was issued to establish the National Women, the National Committee for Women, which was housed under the Council of Chambers. I was a member then in it, and it's the first official government body that was uh, established by royal decree to empower women into the private sector. Now, it was extremely low profile. Many people don't know that it even existed. And this is the same committee that today has been changed into the National Committee for Women, which, again, I had under the Council of Chambers. And obviously, uh, many other government decisions came that obviously, you know, took the light from this body. Uh, after that, we saw women uh, entering into Shura in 2013 and then municipality elections. But this era of King Abdullah from 2006 until 2016, I would say that we just touched upon women empowerment in terms of government support or regulation, or et cetera. But, and with the vision 2016, um, you know, I think it was just until 2017 that we started seeing real decisions uh, to empower women. Uh, now, um, I spoke about the pillars that I like to, or the lens that I like to analyze the woman journey, and it's really three uh, three uh, pillars. One is the social issues and the mindset of the society, and uh, whether it's the family, the father, the husband, or the woman. So the first pillar is how our mindset changed as individuals in Saudi and women in the center of it. Number to the education and the skills, the education of women and their skills, um, you know, from what kind of, uh, you know, how they took education, what access did they have, um, a scholarship, uh, King Abdullah's scholarship program, and the skills. And, you know, there's a huge difference between education and skills. We've always had larger number of women graduating from universities, but much less skills with women. Uh, we, it, we used to invest in soft skills. Now we invest in other skills. The third and last uh, pillar, but I think is the most crucial, is the regulatory and the government. Uh, you know, uh, I don't think anyone uh, is not sustainable to go against regulation or against government. So from King Abdullah until this era, the re regulatory environment to support women was not developed. Uh, most notably is, you know, inability to drive, connection to the male guardian, just no focus on the identity of a woman uh, per se. So therefore, 
but you will cannot flourish. Over from 2009, I've been officially, you know, um, joining uh, delegations uh, with the government. I was with the first delegation with King Abdullah to China, but representing the civil society, speaking about the private sector. Um, I went to Brussels representing the private sector. I went, I mean, every year I would go with the Ministry of Commerce or, or Foreign Affairs to represent, um, you know, the Saudi delegation. But when I'd come back home, I didn't have that same access, uh, but I was, you know, just an investment banker. So it's these three pillars that I, I see how it changed over the years. Uh, Come, come the uh, vision, which, you know, I think I had this interesting discussion with Nuran. I said in the vision, the vision is not just about the women. I would say women were less than 5% in terms of the agenda of the vision. Uh, the vision is about the transformation of the whole country. And uh, again, in three pillars, one being gov uh, government and governance, two being social and three being economic. Obviously, the economic is the main driver for the whole transformation. However, the first first uh, issues that started were the social and the first within that was uh, health well-being women empowerment engagement uh, youth uh, empowering um, females so we suddenly became on the agenda again but under with a new with a different objective that of fulfilling you know economic need fulfilling you know social uh, equality etc so Although the folder of women has always been in the five-year economic, um, we've always had since the 70s, a five-year economic plan, which always had a chapter called women and family. But, you know, and people say, what's the, what's the difference in the vision when the vision started? And it was just on paper in 2016. I remember I had the presentation in Washington and they said, you're talking about this, but this has always been in the literature. What's the decision? I said, I don't know. But if I had to guess, it's the political will to implement. It's like having a better project manager. You've always had the project there lingering for 10 years where people say we need to empower women, etc. But we didn't have the right tools when it came to implementation. With Crown Prince, of course, everybody knows the story. I mean, uh, we are living, I think, an unparalleled time, really. Um, I think it would be uh, many series if we wanted to, uh, you know, talk about the changes, whether it's governmental, uh, uh, social or economic. Uh, today, I know we want to talk about social. I, I I I have been uh, swooped by this wave myself because in 2017, before that, I was you know humbly engaged in my investment banking in various committees. I was heading the audit committee for Oryx, which is the first leasing company, and I was actually the first female to head an audit committee for a, a financing company. But it was all under the radar. And then uh, from 2017, as the momentum for changing the society grew. And I do remember it because suddenly we were all over the media. It was uh, Sarah Sahemi appointed the chairman of the exchange, uh, Rania Nashar being the first CEO of Samba, and then they put me as the first um, uh, president for the National Committee for Statistics, which was the first time in the history of the council to have a woman appointed. And by the way, I was, you know, they chose like 20, they appointed 25 individuals from around the kingdom. I really knew no one of them. And from our first meeting, they voted me the president. I was shocked. I actually didn't want to because I didn't know how this thing works. But I was very impressed that, you know, they would trust uh, and, you know, there's just only one woman with me and all the other 19 were just men. So I was very, uh, you know, uh, scared, honestly, but also, uh, you know, r rose to the occasion. So, uh, so when we talk about women in boards, I want to go a step back a little bit and talk. And what I was just talking about now is the whole women empowerment journey in Saudi. I think now women empowerment is history as as a theme. Uh, if you drill down to that, it's about uh, lobbying for women in leadership positions. And then if you drill down, then it's the folder of the board. Because women in boards, for me, is just one tool for uh, women in leadership positions and a very effective tool, obviously. And it's something that we have been working on in the uh, Council for Women. I've been working on it directly with the CMA or with other uh, regulators. Uh, they have all labeled me as, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, empowering women and 
honestly, this rhetoric of women empowerment has become now the new language of the government. I would say in many ministries now, there are dedicated uh, projects for women empowerment. When the Ministry of Industry was established in 2019, and I was part of the team that lobbied for challenges in the, in, in the uh, industrial sector, and we ended up going to Crown Prince, and uh, he ended up establishing, re-establishing the Ministry of Industry. In the first week, the Minister of industry did a forum called women in industry uh, so there is so much hype now and dedication from various government uh you know uh, entities uh that uh, are are saying you know how what other initiatives could we do to empower women this is one we all know the story of Rima Bandar and all the you know other uh senior positions including the first deputy minister uh um, you know, a few years ago, and then Minister of Education hired four deputies immediately, Hamad Ali Sheikh. So it is not surprising today when you look at the social media and you see all these royal decrees and it's women in senior positions. Now, is it enough? Absolutely not. And this is what I say until we get a minister. So, of course, it is not enough. But what I want to, the shift that I see, and I'm very, you know, delighted is that the government that talked in 2016 and 17 that we need women empowerment has now actually opened the doors. So where, where, where are we now and what are the challenges that we face today in terms of women empowerment? Um, throughout my journey about speaking about women empowerment, of course, I always customize my message to my audience, to be honest, but here I'll try to be fair to cover all because when I go to the government, I say we need more, we need etc. Uh, and today, I actually my audience are the women themselves because I say now uh, it is your role now to push through the doors that have been opened. And the biggest challenge uh, we I see today, although it is being misused and abused by our counter, I would say men, I apologize to all the men because they keep which is the knowledge and skill and experience. Because now, uh, you know, because of the, you know, uh, demographic or the structure or our history, we were, we, many, many women have not had the, just the time to go through experiences or to join, uh, uh, you know, a regular, normal, integrated society, which is only coming uh, about today. Uh, let's not underestimate the power and impact of having a normal civil society where I can go out to a restaurant or drive my car, just driving the car, which people think is just something, um, you know, uh, not very important, I think is very critical because it gives you access to places, to mobility. Uh, and um, I remember in January 2006, I read an article where a man was saying, and I never you know, wrote in, in, in newspapers, a man was saying women should not drive. I don't understand. And I got so furious that I, you know, I wrote back to this article and I said, women, you look at it from an economic point of view, women are an asset and asset have to be mobile. And that, you know, I said, I understand why men uh, or families are against it because either they don't trust their, this is what I was thinking 2006, so no judgment. So I said, and I think men, uh, families have control over their children where they go and they're, they're fearful of lack of control. The second thing is what less than 1% of women are actually going out to real jobs. Uh, so there is no importance. The perception is that women go to shops and uh, uh, parties in the end of the, the, the uh, late. So they don't feed the necessity. Only if you need, need to go through surgery or to, you know, uh, meetings that you really appreciate. Anyway, this is all history now, but this is the history that I lived. I don't want to talk much, but I just want to maybe wrap up with a few points uh, and numbers. So um, my personal journey uh, is, uh, you know, when I when I uh, when the transformation started and it really, you know, threw me like a wave because suddenly I started getting, you know, calls and uh, requests to be involved in committees and boards, government, private sector, mainly government. And that was so yeah, and lovely, honestly, and uh, empowering, really empowering. Um, then I said, okay, we need to improve the rhetoric because the stakeholders I were dealing with are government that needed to have more employment and women engaged. And by the way, uh, I think in December 2019, we crossed the 1 million uh, uh, women employed. Just to put things in perspective, 
the total private sector is around uh, 3 million uh, men and women, which is not a big number. Uh, people think that uh, the Saudi population is 30 million. Yes, it is, but uh, around maybe 12 are foreigners. And the employable uh, base is maybe 4 or 5 million. The employed are around 3 million. So the numbers of Saudis, if you focus on, is really, really, uh, I think 2015, we had around 350,000 women only working. Uh, today, we are more than a million million and 3,000 maybe. I mean, and uh, so the massive growth is of course due to structural changes. It's not normal growth, it's due to, to structural change. Uh, please tell me if I'm crossing my time. And um, okay, so uh, when uh, so when the tr when I start when the transformation happened, and then I started taking leadership positions. Obviously, um, uh, for me, there is a big file for empowering women in my job, other than investment banking and other than uh, assisting in policies uh, for government committees. Uh, so you know, I've now today I've adapted to these three really overlapping uh, uh, you know, highways in my career, in my work, and hopefully I will shrink this very soon. But the women, the women uh, part, I've always been involved in giving presentations and putting the agenda for the committee. So if you tell me today, what are you working on in terms of women empowerment? I'm working on, the past two years, we worked on uh, promoting women in leadership positions. And this is not only with the government, because we see that the government has already opened this door, although you need politics, you need networking, you need comfort from the other side, the government, in order to appoint women. It takes maybe a whole year uh, in order to vet an individual, be it male or woman, to take a senior position in government. This is why. Uh, number two, uh, 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 talking to women themselves. Women themselves, as the um, you know, the vision has opened for them opportunities, mobility. Uh, I would also say uh, la uh, uh, feeling safe and respected. Very strict regulations. Um, you know, many people, including myself, I'm extremely uh, pleased to see how normal it is for women to suddenly become heads of departments, heads of boards, heads, and there is absolutely no pushback. Now, the the reason is, I personally believe, it's education and skill. I say that we have always existed, but only uh, catering for women. Now we suddenly have clients that are men and women. So it for. For, for many women like myself who've been fortunate to be in leadership positions uh, in their career, it's just another day. Uh, uh, maybe personally, when I became head of a department in 2003 in Samba, that was the first time I hated it. I hated, I hated leading anybody, individuals, when I was on my own, and then I had to deal with people and their plans and evaluation, etc. I didn't like it. I had to train myself. Now, many, many years later, it's secondhand, especially after my kids. Uh, so it, it takes a lot for you to, um, to understand what does it mean to be uh, to lead. And, uh, you know, I've heard so many uh, discussions about the definition of leadership, etc. And personally, my uh, favorite answer, I don't know if I made it up or I heard it honestly, but it's really being able to make difficult decisions. It has nothing to do with the volume of work you do. I could be, you know, extremely busy doing extremely unimportant things, but or, or five minutes making a decision that's life-changing. So leadership is being able to make these very difficult decisions and obviously making it, uh, you know, wisely based on knowledge. So it's knowledge and skill that is really uh, uh, the key to empowering women to the next level. So when we move now from the message of women in leadership position, and now we want to focus on boards, and I'm very happy to join uh, with you, Jane, and all these lovely women to, to move this folder, which I think is just a folder. Uh, but it's a very critical folder. Today, we have more than 200, we have 223 listed companies, and they change by the week in Saudi. From these, I went quickly to see how many women are on boards. I've reached more than 45, and then I stopped looking. Now, there are other women. Now, I bet you three years ago, not one woman existed. So uh, I can also tell you that in the Council of Chambers, the now this, uh, this year is the fourth year. So the, the term before, we had more than less than 
10 women. Today, we have 60 women in committees of which at least three or four are heading these uh, committees. The also Council of Chamber, uh, I had there the uh, Committee for the Financial Sector. Before that, I had the statistics. There are two other women heading other national committees which represent the whole private sector, 24 chambers with the government. So. Uh, Absolutely, women uh, uh, voice in front of the government is completely established. And actually, I would say they are, you know, desperate looking for women who have skills in order to support them. Now, is that the right career? I don't know. That's another that's another question. Uh, finally, um, today, when we talk about boards and, you know, I've asked my question uh, myself this question for this particular session no, okay so what's the what is different uh and uh, what's the problem in having more women uh, in boards and sometimes we, we think that the problem is we think that the problem is is really or the solution is really difficult for the problem but it's actually sometimes it's awareness it's very small technical things so i answered this question is why don't we have more women in boards first of all um we're talking about having one point uh, one million one hundred and eighty nine thousand um, uh, companies in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Eighty eight percent of those are sole proprietorship, no governance, no requirement, one man show run by family. Eight uh, percent, which is ninety six thousand of this one point uh, two million almost, is limited liability companies. Again, no company's law requires any boards, etc. Now, some very few of those limited liability companies, like my company, have put in boards. Uh, but and for me, because of the capital market authority, but. I would say 99% of limited liability companies do not have uh, boards. The company's law requires a shareholder meeting or majlis mudirin or which is which is not a board basically, but it could be like an executive committee. Uh, less than 1%, 0.5%, uh, which is around 5,050 5, uh, companies are Total joint stock companies in the kingdom. Uh, when I say joint stock, 223 are listed. The rest, which is around 5,500, uh, are closed joint stock companies. Now, closed joint stock companies only, all only joint stock. Obviously, the listed, the 200, of course, they will have to have not only boards and board committees, but forced independent board members. So this, for me, is the easiest target to, lo to lobby, although I reached 40 women only going over 123 companies. So I think I will reach maybe 100 ladies on board, let alone committees. So I think the listed companies, but maybe shedding more light on them and you know, uh, promoting them. Uh, although the CMA is extremely eager, um, very supportive, uh, it's just you know the door is, the ball is in the court of women themselves to come and say. The closed joint stock companies, on the other hand, although they're joint stock, I mean, this is where this is my target client in investment banking. I go to these people to say, let's take you public. I would say that, and I have not covered all of them, obviously, I would say that 99% are family owned businesses. Boards are reflected, uh, boards reflect the power of the family and not even the shareholders. Uh, this is one. Number two, uh, uh, Unfortunately, the new company's law reduced the governance in terms of required, like for example, they canceled the requirement for audit committees for uh, reduced the governance on joint on closed joint stock and made it more easier and flexible for families. On the other hand, introduced new documents, uh, regulatory changes, which, and the reason I'm focusing on this, because I believe if we have better governance, it will be easier to onboard females. I'm not talking about uh, uh, family females, I'm uh, females from the family. I'm talking about any qualified female to onboard if the entity moves into more governance and transparency, because this is where uh, you can make, uh, you know, the difference. So the uh, it introduced, for example, the ability to have a family code, a creed, uh, which will be accepted by law. This means that even as a family, I can put whatever requirement I want for empowering men, women, whatever. And also it allowed for shareholder agreements, which did not exist previously and joint stock companies. 
Previously, joint stock companies closed or uh, or listed would have to follow the uh, uh, Ministry of Commerce, uh, you know, rules in the articles. So therefore, this was a major deterrent for company owners or fam to include people that they don't feel they trust because really the control is not in their hands. So and I believe that the, uh, the, the new changes in, in company uh, laws are could be, I mean, if designed well, uh, to could could uh, be uh, you know more uh, you know uh, supportive for women inclusion of independent. Now, on the other hand, and I like to give you the uh, the good news and bad news. The bad news is there is also a, a big movement from the gov uh, the regulators uh, to enforce. Uh, obviously to uh, crack down on board responsibilities. So board members now are being sued. Shareholder activism is now rising and something new coming up in the kingdom in order you know, to have a more developed market, investor relations, et cetera. A lot of emphasis now, um, even myself as a board director in a listed company, we have indemnities now. And so this kind of environment really needs a, a, a strong woman um, okay, so to conclude, where are we today? I think that the ball is already rolling. Uh, and I think that the ball uh, is, uh, you know, the stakeholder that needs to move faster and bigger are women. And I think what we have today is an example of uh, collaboration that could, you know, help in moving this forward. Uh, the government and the vision has so much emphasis on uh, the private sector rising up men before women in order to support. So I think women today have so many low hanging fruits. I'm sorry to use all these words to, to have so many low hanging fruits that can push women forward to be more engaged. Uh, least of saying, you know, the inclusion of women, the financial inclusion, our G20 participation. I mean, there, there's a long list of government and semi-government and private sector initiatives that justify and uh, uh, give us uh, other than just gender equality. Because, Anna, I think just using gender equality, uh, although it's extremely obviously legitimate, but in Saudi, it is very sensitive. And I think we have more additional uh, economic reasons that we can empower women uh, for them to uh, participate for. With this, I will stop and I apologize for the long talk. Jane. Ruth, that was fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And I've followed your journey and uh, I mean, you inspire all of us. And, and um, I've been visiting Saudi now for just over seven years and the changes that I have seen in that time are quite phenomenal, phenomenal as a country um, in every aspect. And of course, women have also benefited from that. So I think as you are saying, there are huge opportunities out there, but it doesn't mean to say that there aren't some barriers um, and, and, and challenges. And, and we talk as always about the glass ceiling, um, which I think is still there, but and we talk about the sticky floor where the women themselves, you talked about pushing the door, but the women themselves aren't necessarily ready to push the door. Um, let, let's just start with some questions here and then we'll open up to everybody. So um, there's a question here from Liz Sen. Um, how are male colleagues in the board feeling about these changes, she says. OK, I'll talk from my experience. Um, uh, extremely, extremely welcoming, obviously. Um, and my experience in Arabian drilling, uh, which half of it, you know, Schlumberger, uh, first of all, in order to join a board, uh, let's distinguish. Listed company is completely different. Let's just separate them because when it's a listed company and you have to be uh, obviously nominated and you go through a, a rigorous process of, you know, a CV, CMA approvals, etc., you are not going to go through that journey if you are not accepted on the other side, honestly. Maybe the new company's law allows companies to appoint, but the listed companies, the governance of the company's law kind of protects you that you do not reach that seat if there is no acceptance one. My personal um, experience, and not only now on boards, uh, Honestly, throughout my career from 97, when I came from the US and joined Samba, always being the only woman in the room, 99.9, .9, I don't want to say 100%, but I would say 99.9, .9, I have always been supported by men. I have never felt a backlash. 
Now, uh, is it my personality to kind of adapt uh, or be be friendly and not threatening? Because a hundred percent, sorry, Dr. Abdel Latif, and a hundred percent, there is always uh, you know a challenge to have men accept you, and I think this is everywhere, but more so in our culture, and for legitimate reasons. You just they're just not used to it. I mean, when I started. Uh, my George in Georgetown, and I was the only uh, I was uh, studying with men. Although I've always lived a mixed life, I was extremely uncomfortable in class. So I had to adapt. Although I was so, it is natural and human. So I think there is that element of uh, uh, you know accepting the other gender, being the only woman. Uh, but it's been extremely uh, positive. But I do say the good news is that you have the control to make that happen, to make that easy. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, please, uh, to our participants, please do put your questions on mm. uh, the uh, the Q and A. Um, I think there's another question here from Noxolo. What other initiatives can you share that will enable more women to break the glass ceiling? Maybe, um, I mean, you've got a very strong personality, Hlud, that comes over very strongly. And, and I'm sure that you fought all the way to, to, to get your voice heard. Um, and and, they've, and you've, you've pushed that door and taken those opportunities, even when it was quite frightening, I heard you say, being the only woman in the room. Yeah. Um, and, and many of us have, have perhaps been in that situation as well. But how do other women who perhaps um, have the skills and competences, you know, how do they break through? Do you think what what advice would you give them sure there is there is one advice that we give to any student that wants or someone that starts their career that women i think do it more than are, are you know are guilty of it is that we never ask we never we have a lot of self doubt so and i always say because i've always been mentoring students and getting jobs etc and i learned from that and what i learned is that it's it's absolutely natural and human to be fearful to to uh, um, excel in your career there's always one reason or another oh i'm going to have children oh I'm, I'm, I, I don't think I'll be, you know, up to this responsibility. I don't know why women have the self-doubt. I mean, we could always justify it from the way we've been brought up in this culture. Uh, but uh, I did, observe, and I was guilty of it. For many years, I never asked for a raise for many years. But you know what pushed me? And this is what I turned into an advisory package for my students, is that uh, I never asked. But what, what pushed me is my knowledge and my skill. Of course, I would add my wonderful personality. Of course, I have to. No, I'm just kidding. That's a joke. That's a joke because I actually one individual that was working for me uh, when he resigned, I had to ask him, of course, uh, Citibank, I had to ask him, why did you resign? And I have to document that. And I have to say that he said that you're too tough and you ask for things that are unreasonable. So, you know, I don't think I have a perfect personality, but I learned from him because, you know, uh, he made me try to look at myself. So, uh, what advice would I have is uh, education, 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 and I would say relevant education uh, and uh, develop your skills. Uh, care about what you are doing. Uh, one sentence I've always been told, oh, when you moved from the banking sector to running your own business, you worked much harder. That's obviously logical. I said, what? Of course not. This doesn't even make sense to me. I've always worked as if I worked for myself. So it's it's the mindset. So education to the level that obviously if you didn't, if you weren't fortunate to come from a background or a family that gave you this mindset, hopefully education will give you that. So you have to have the right positive uh, um, uh, mindset one. And this, and this mindset, you have to feed it with education. So this is what I tell people, even my kids, you have to study, you have to learn, you have to implement one. And then the asking. The asking is obviously you have to develop your social skills and you see kids today in even universities how they come and they behave and act as if they're entrepreneurs because this is the buzz now. Everybody is, uh, let me say, decision makers today and people who are uh, like myself a little bit older are giving back these secret tools to tell them work on yourself, act. And there's so many initiatives I see in the society that is promoting these kids to be adults, actually, maybe sometimes too much. So to summarize this, 
there is nothing as powerful as knowledge and skills. If you have them, even if you don't go and proactively ask, you will be noticed and you will be dragged uh, into uh, why, because there is so much need for knowledge and real work that if you develop a skill, it will be noticed. Uh, I will conclude with one example that happened to me when I came from the US in 97, I had my MBA and I was starting on my CFA. So the minute I joined Samba, which was completely men, they were working on building the, the tower, Kingdom Tower. So someone said, oh, there's a lady that came from the US that knows how to do financial model. Lady, I had no name, but they knew that I did because I was doing financial modeling and I was enjoying it and talking about regression, etc. And they thought I was crazy. Now I think I was, but anyway, so they, they said, they said, oh, do you know how to do financial modeling? I said, yes. So I went and I sat with this guy who came from Citibank, just one individual who was doing this model. And I said, oh, that's easy. So I started cleaning it up, which was cosmetic, obviously, but they were, you know, they were stunned. After that, they started dragging me into so many meetings. So uh, having knowledge and skill will will, you know, suck you as a vacuum into the, into opportunities. Then you can. Uh, you know, move forward. Sorry well, for the long answer. Questions. Lots of questions here. Um, two questions, perhaps I'll take. Um, why, what, what do you think drove the changes in Saudi that you've talked about, number one? And secondly, a question from Beverly. Do women experience pay gaps due to their gender or is there total equality um, in Saudi in terms of pay? Excellent question. Okay, so the first one is uh, the first one is what affected the changes now? Political will, simply political will. The good news is the ingredients have always been there, and we have been working on ourselves. So when the, I say we were in a dark room, they just lit up, and oh, where did these women come from? Honestly, so and then we quickly aligned ourselves to participate. But if the government and, uh, you know, King Salman or, or our crown prince, uh, who I adore, did not open the door, we would still be doing the same thing. It's just, you know, it's 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 the right project manager to implement in the right way. And those who followed the history of the uh, uh, the uh, division itself, you know, when we started 2016, 17, it was all done by consultants completely independent from the society. And, you know, the black clash happened and then they did version uh, for uh, uh, 2.0 and then they engaged us more in workshops, uh, uh, students, private sector, women, etc. I mean, the Ministry of Labor in 2000, September 2018. See how early? September 2018. The minister, Arraji, he just become minister in May, gathered maybe 200 of the private sector. And he said, I want to announce the objectives of the ministry. Five objectives. Number one, women empowerment. I was going to cry. I was like, what? Never in the history of the kingdom that the ministry has its number one objective, women empowerment. Today, just the Ministry of Labor has two programs that give funding for women for up to two years to pay their monthly Uber rides if you don't know how to drive and uh, up to four children for the daycare. So there is so much, uh, you know, a uh, change on the ground. Uh, uh, so it's it's really how they, they said, how can we really change? And they came with these solutions. It wasn't correct in the beginning. In the beginning, there was no focus on women uh, per se. But in 2017, 18 and today, February, February, uh, February uh, 2018, uh, Crown Prince, uh, we went to a delegation to the UK. It's the first time in the history of the kingdom that there's an official panel for women leaders, Rima Bandar, Rania Nashar, et cetera. It was in London. This was the, and then he went to Paris and New York. So this was the first you know, delegation that had in its agenda panel for women. So much has, has happened. So the reason is we have a wonderful king, uh, a wonderful crown prince that decided to implement using real skill, real knowledge. This one. Uh, the second question was uh, on pay, pay, gap. Equal pay. pay gap. Yeah, if we, I'll tell you from economic and regulation, economic point of view, obviously, when you have so f before the transformation, and maybe now somewhat because it's economic ability to create jobs, because you know jobs are a function of economy, and if I'm going through a turbulent time. You know, men and women don't have jobs. But when we had uh, so few jobs available socially and regulatory point, from a regulatory point of view for women to be able to attend or go or drive to, obviously you would find women that had PhDs that would be paid a salary of someone with a high school. This was a long time ago. Because she, now, on the other hand, 
I don't know the percentage of women that really wanted to work because I was a loner myself and very, very few. And everybody around me, no one wanted to work. It was socially, you know, just the mindset was different. Now, uh, today, there is a regulation that forbids, this is regulation, uh, 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 salary inequality. So if you have the same job and your salary is different, then you can go and it will be, you know, by the law. However, I always go by economics. If you have the right skill, you will be paid. If you have the right skill. Anna, today, if I find someone that does modeling or valuation, I will pay him regardless of gender. And this is the same with anyone. The, the missing um, puzzle was that uh, socially was not accepted for women to be around men or to mix with them. So even for an employer, I'm not able to hire women comfortably without being safe that someone will come and say, oh, you don't have the right setting, one. So this obviously made it for me, the opportunity cost to hire is so high. Why should I hire a woman where I have a separate door or a separate? So even for, for um, you know job creation, all of this is history now. So the dynamics are changing. I don't have statistics, but I can tell you there is absolutely not one impediment for any employer today to hire women in any position, which is great. And I, I think, I mean, there's several points there, uh, Clute. I think Saudi Arabia is one of the few countries in the world to have a law on equal pay. Um, I, I wish we had it everywhere else. And secondly, um, I think that um, there is a shortage of women. Um, I, I think that they are in a prime position now, just like in South Africa, when we had, uh, when, you know, black empowerment, um, the, the women in South Africa were called the golden skirts because everybody wanted them, right? Um, so yeah. I think this is a, a similar situation now that we're seeing in, in Saudi in, in many ways. Um, there are some more questions for you, Hlud. Um, There's a question here from Nadine saying, in many places, it is still a fact that men dominate the boardrooms. What qualities do they look for in women in order to, for, to accept them? Um, okay, so boardrooms obviously, again, are different. And when I was appointed by the minister in the boardroom of Riyadh Chamber, about four years earlier, I ran for election, although I got the largest number of votes among women, but because of the structure of voting, I didn't get, I wasn't appointed, and the minister didn't appoint me. Four years later, I was appointed. So government boards is about representation, and today, you know, government appoints women because they want gender equality. This is the agenda of the government. It's not economic. It's not. And so you would, you would, you can come and say, "Oh, this deputy minister is she really qualified?" You will hear, you hear a lot of things. Anna, I'm from the school that says, "Just let's put the woman on the board, and then inshallah, you know, they will." Because uh, uh, you don't have to be a hundred percent ready for what is needed. The question is. Uh, what does, uh, you know, I look at a board membership as a job. What's the job description? And that really relates to what is this board? What is it supposed to do? So if I, I'm appointed in the board of Riyadh Chamber, I really lobby for the private sector, the skills I need to have, which I immediately, I, I don't think I was appointed uh, by accident. I was appointed because the uh, few years earlier, I continued to lobby with the government on certain issues. So they must have thought, okay, she has the right lobbying, uh, you know, skills. So I was appointed there now the board other boards uh, that are i would say you know business related like listed companies like arabian drilling for example my finance and accounting background and that's why i get stuck in audit committees so many audit committees is because of my you know my love for accounting and finance and governance uh, so uh, uh, if you talk about listed companies all of them now are required by law to have a certain percent i think two-thirds of independent board members now uh, the regulation in terms of the qualification is not very strict, although maybe you know better than I, I do. I'm probably involved in developing more criteria now. The CMA is interested in that, although there's a fine line between the company's law that says as a board member, you really you have a right because you are as a shareholder. I'm sorry, you have a right to elect your board member. So there is there is a constitutional uh, right there for shareholders to to appoint. And then you say, OK, how can I dictate certain uh, criteria? Now, in the financial sector, like any entity licensed by the CMA or SAMA, uh, the central bank, you, you, you fall under the regulation for leadership positions. So if you are in a board to be appointed there, no, you have to have certain education, credential, blah, 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 et cetera. Maybe not exams yet, but they don't accept anyone. Um, so the question is, 
uh, it depends on which board we want to join. So if we talk about joint stock companies in the economy in general, I think a board member, I don't think you will have someone that will be completely well-rounded in everything. But I think you need to see what is the objective of the company, what sector they're in, and, and uh, the, uh, the board should have a diversified selection of knowledge that caters for that industry. But and this is theory, I tell you, because how can you select? I mean, in ADC, we have a few people that have experience in rigs that don't exist in the world. I don't know how we got them, honestly. But uh, for me, being finance and accounting, I think I can be in any. Now, I would uh, highly recommend any woman that has a knowledge or expertise, you're in education, you're in contracting, you're legal, to go and seek boards that have to make decisions in these areas. Now, this is one. The other way is you learn and you empower yourself when in Citibank, one of the best uh, heads of corporate banking that I, you know, uh, worked with, uh, who was a city banker, his name was Gus Felix. Uh, he was a history major and he was head of corporate banking in Citibank. One of the best CEOs of Samba Citibank was Mike de Graffenried, who's a lawyer, who was legal and he was head of Samba. So you, you, it's the theory about can you head an organization and be a good leader, even if your background and education is not in that? I mean, can a doctor head a hospital? The answer is it depends. If he, if he is able to develop the skills, knowledge enhances skills, but it's the skills in order to lead. So to be a board member, you have to, uh, you know, have the knowledge and the skills required to deliver the objective of that particular board. I'm sorry for long answer. Do, do women bring maybe in terms of soft skills, right? Do women bring different skills to the board or different uh, competences or different aspects to the board? Absolutely. I will tell you passion, persistent, nagging in a good way. But I'll tell you, the first board meeting in Riyadh Chamber, we had to review all the committees. And we used to have, we had a committee called Women Committee before. So the first thing the men said, they were 18. Okay, wait, there are 16 and two women. They said, okay, so we, we can cancel now the women committee. I said, excuse me, until we are 50% on this board, no women committee will be canceled. I said, what are you talking about? We have no way now. Our agenda is women, you had, and I said, no, 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 50% and then. And my voice, only my voice, because my friend was not there that day. It was just me. The chairman looked at me and he said, okay, we will agree. So the board, the committee is still here. So what do women bring if you're we're passionate? And I think whether you have children or not, you have the instinct to really give everything. Now, unless you have this passion, you will be any normal board member. By the way, even men. I mean, uh, I got this um, pushback from a lot of women saying, Khulud, don't just promote women. You have They have to be the right woman. I said, no, I'm going to promote just women. Because if you even reach to a leadership position, uh, no... Uh, I mean, uh, how are you going to learn if you don't try it? I, I mean, I got a pushback from a, a friend of mine who was appointed as a CEO, and then I wanted to recommend someone else to be a CEO, and then she told me, no, 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 Khulud, we shouldn't push her. She's not good. I said, were you good when you did? We were nominated for CEO. You had no clue what was going on. She said, okay. So, uh, yes, we do, we do bring uh, uh, a lot of passion and persistence. A couple more questions here um, before we before we wrap up with this section. I think um, there is one from Ebit Sam who's on our, on our panel and saying, um, I mean, I think basically what she's saying is, how can we get more women in the boardroom? You mentioned two hundred and twenty three listed companies. If we say that the average number in 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 Saudi is seven board directors, that's still one thousand four hundred. And you counted 45. Okay, you didn't get through. Maybe there's 100, but we're still it's far away from your 50%. Yeah. So what do we need to do to get more women um, on boards? What would be the standards or the or the tools to do that? That's a bit, a bit, a bit to sell, yeah. I think, question. I think I think it's all easy and good news. And um, you know, a lot of people say, "Oh, why don't they open this business and that business?" I say because no one thought about it. No one did it. It's really that simple. Now, boards, of course, I'm simplifying it, but if I want to be on a board of a listed company, and by the way, I get phone calls all the time from men, my friends, and some even, I don't even know who they are. Please, Khulud, nominate us. See, see what men do? They call. 
So first of all, know the regulations. Now for listed companies, they publish nominations. Literally anyone on the street can uh, uh, submit their CV. I actually headed the, the nomination committee for ADC for a while. And I, I went through the cycle of onboarding other independent members and the number of CVs I get from I got from men and most of them young kids, I say, I would say young kids, but, you know, very junior men that don't have few years of experience. And I was like, wow, they really feel that they can, you know, submit to be on a board of a Schlumberger company. I mean, I, I thought it was very interesting. And then I and then I told a lot of my friends who were asking how I said, I know this is not known. I didn't even really know about it until I was appointed of the process. So literally follow all the listed companies when the, their board cycle, there are two ways. When the the, um, the tenor, because, you know, you, you they announce when the board finishes and when they announce they have 30 days announcement, just submit your CV, obviously for an independent board member. Now, the other thing is you go and find out the shareholders and lobby with the shareholders and tell them, I would like you to appoint me. Now, this is the second way, which I've never done. But, you know, I've usually had people call me, um, uh, shareholders saying, oh, what do you think of us, you know, supporting you here? We like you. So, it really boils down to your knowledge and skills. If you have your knowledge and skills, people will seek you. Yeah, so this is on the uh, on the listed companies. On the non-listed companies, what I would do, obviously people like me and there are many others and like you, Jane, who are raising, who we should have campaigns, events. Yani now, after this session, definitely I would recommend that in the Council of Chambers or in the Chamber uh, of Commerce, in the Council of Chambers, because we have the Women Empowerment Committee, in the Chamber, because I'm in the board, we have 130,000 uh, uh, listed uh, companies. This is only Riyadh Chamber, where we can invite them all and talk about, you know, uh, uh, thinking about appointing women and leadership, because first, if you don't uh, support them or talk to them about how how about you empower women to leadership positions, whether from your family or outside? What does that mean? One. And then giving them the board uh, position. Because keep in mind that boards now are really empowered with the governance and things that board makes today stick in courts. So, you know, there is this backlash. So it's it's uh, really uh, uh, awareness, communication, and moving. There is no barrier except yourself. One last question, Claude, before we wrap this session. Um, in the UAE, there is a law that listed companies have to have at least one woman now on the board. Um, India, company law, it's not listed companies. Every company has to have one woman on the board. And they've even extended that now to say that it's got to be an independent woman on the board in India because people are appointing their mother, their sister, their daughter and saying, you're appointed, but you can't say anything, right? <laughs> Yeah. So that's what my dad told me in my first meeting with him. That's what my dad <laughs> told me when I joined the company. <laughs> I'm sure. Um, what do you think about having uh, a regulation or a law that says we should have a minimum of one woman or a minimum of one man? Let's make yeah. it gender neutral um, on the board of any company or on the board of a listed company. Yeah. Um, uh, in 2006, when I uh, joined the National Committee for Women, and that's like the first time that I officially become a semi-government body for women. Before that, I was just keeping to myself within the financial sector. The first logical thing that comes to mind is regulation. So I used to, I, so I went in 2006 to the Ministry of uh, Labor and I said, listen, because we started having all these meetings about women and ILO and the cases against Saudi for women, etc. And I was part of that. So I said, guys, uh, you have you have this whole uh, um, they have a department called Women Department in the Ministry of Labor from 2006, which actually drew the guidelines of how women would work. Uh, because this was, you know, back then, you have to keep in mind that the government's mindset is what do the people want based on culture and religion? And let's design regulation to fit that. This was, by the way, the, the this was the mentality and not the other way around. People think that the government has always oppressed women in Saudi. No, no, no. They've always tried to reflect what they wanted. Uh, when women started driving, 
driving many, many years ago, uh, we had a backlash of women against women, by the way. So when I started in 2006, I said, how about regulations? Let's have regulations, et cetera. And they're like, no, 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 this is very, con why regulations? We love women, we support women. We shouldn't, they should be equally by natural. So I came years later now, because I had this discussion on many layers with the government uh, um, you know, entities that were interested in this, is why don't we have affirmative action, et cetera, et cetera. I did a study and I realized not even Europe has that. And then Europe said, no, 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 this is, uh, we have, we don't have uh, mandatory quotas. And I, then I found out that this particular issue, extremely controversial around the world. And to be honest, I agree with both sides. This is the problem. So I said, okay, let me pick my battles. And now we, the, uh, two years ago, we started with the CMA and the CMA, maybe you know, signed last year or the year before with Hinda Zahed, an MOU in order to support women and boards. Now, Definitely, the uh, the field is green, and definitely bringing a proposal uh, about regulations. If you ask me today, I say that the government took so many major steps to make us, uh, let me say, integrated normally, and I'd rather that than having a line separate. You know, I'm seeing the benefit now. Of course, I do change my opinion based on uh, you know what I see, the results. Today, I see women ambassadors. I see women everywhere, and I see every time I uh, I give a you know a recommendation, the next step they say, "Come and do it." So I stop giving any recommendations. So the door is open. The door is open. So I would think I, I'm I'm you know I I definitely think it is time to go to the CMA because we did. And they're very hesitant for because they also are sensitive to their official role of being independent, let alone using this issue, which is considered really social slash political, and to come and say and enforce. Because if uh, the, the, I think the right way that needs to be done, regardless of whether we bring in regulation later, is actually raising awareness uh, from the existing decision makers, the businesses, the families, the business owners to understand the impact of women and to themselves find the solutions. I will conclude by saying one of the projects we are doing now in the council is to draft a letter that will go to all the private sector, the 5,000 companies, saying that we would like you to adopt a strategy for empowering women you choose whatever you want, but an example would be woman here, woman here, woman here. And I think if we recognize that reaching a board doesn't come from the top, the more sustainable if it comes from the bottom. What I mean is that if you hire women that become leaders in the organization and that has proven like fire. I mean, there are so many organizations that would tell you about stories that they, they have amazing women, but you come and tell them, okay, how about you take her up a notch? One final point, the Ministry of Labor uh, launch is launching now, as we speak, a program to, to empower women in leadership positions and in boards. This is the Ministry of Labor. I leave that. Good, good, thank you. I'm gonna pass over to Kamla. Kamla, uh, would you like to say a few words um, and, and then uh, we'll move on to the next part of the agenda. Yes, thank you so much, Jane. I found that this was such a fascinating contribution. And um, in particular, what one key point that I think we, we ought not to miss, because there were so many gems which she shared, but there was one that we need to be aware of as women. And she mentioned that sometimes um, there were so many things to allow for the progression of women, mm -hmm. but the backlash which existed in some instances <clears throat> where it was women themselves, who were holding women back. And, and we have to remember that in the same way we talk about men resisting having women and you know this, this difficulty in overcoming the status quo, it also applies to us. So and I love some of those points, you know, that we build that awareness. And and as she said, we need to identify what are the skill sets, what are the competence that are required so we can prepare ourselves for um being you know more effective in the boardrooms as well so thank you so much absolutely love the gene claude thank you so much for for being with us and for that uh, really interesting session um camilla i think you're now going to introduce uh, francesco in the panel uh, before we do that though jane i see that professor garrett was able to join us um ah, excellent 
is able to unmute Professor Garrett, we would love to hear from you. Um, so can I invite you to, to just take our virtual podium and share uh, some of your thoughts because you know you have provided such support for us here at the Caribbean Corporate Governance Institute. Jane, I should share, we are so proud. Professor Garrett is CCGI's global ambassador. So it is with absolute joy and pleasure, Professor Garrett, that I invite you to, to share and speak with us. You have been a mentor to both Jane and I, assisting our institutes. So please, may we hear from you. Okay, many thanks. Um, and uh, greetings from a very cool, unnaturally cool London. I'm not sure what's going on with the weather anywhere in the world at the moment. Um, but I, I will not give my little speech now um, because we, we want to get into the Q&A. But what I will do is say that I've been astonished um, by the passion um, uh, released by the women I've been working with over the last two years during COVID around the world in the way they are trying to um, get uh, the development of very effective boards and particularly women on boards. So when we find a little space later in the day, I will talk about that. But at the moment, please, let us, let's do a Q&A, much more important. Thank you. Okay. okay. Well, thank you thank very you. much, Jane and, and Professor Garrett. And definitely we'd be looking to, to hear more from you um, later today, perhaps um, after Sharon has done her um, her speech uh, this morning as well. So at this point in time, as Professor Garrett says, you know, the, the conversation has really been so great and therefore we'd like to move to our panel discussion um, for this morning for us here in the Caribbean. And of course it's afternoon for our friends out in the Gulf region. This uh, panel session will be moderated by Francesca Gori, who is Managing Director, Regional Legal Lead of Asia Pacific, uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, Middle East, Africa and Accenture. And the panel discussion itself would look into key challenges, opportunities and what women can do to advance themselves with the right development, strategies, tools and positioning to get them into more senior roles and seats on board. So Francesca, may I invite you to take the podium now and to briefly introduce your panelists and take over the segment of the, the session. Yeah, thanks a lot. Hi everyone, good morning, good afternoon. And to, I, I was definitely astonished by the story of courage and change that they could think, you know, brought, just brought to us and so uh, amazing. Um, so I'm definitely delighted to be part of this series. And I think with, like with many, many, the majority of you, we are all passionate about, you know, women and women rise into the, into the boardroom and actually the executive level. So I will not go uh, through, and this has been agreed with our steam panelists to the bias of, uh, of each of them because we wanted to go directly to the point and bring you know all the experience and, uh, and share the knowledge that they're gonna they're gonna do it with us today and and I'm sure you're gonna find a lot a lot of interesting uh, stories like tips and tactics and uh, understanding of where how we're gonna be able to push the door like Ruth said us right so we we are definitely there. I think uh, we also need to recognize that even though there's been a big change and the rise of the presence of women at the executive level and also in the board, but there is still things that needs to be done, right? There is still a lot of room of improvement. And then we're gonna, we're gonna share, we're gonna understand you know, the challenges and also which are the barriers, but also opportunity that has been already you know, identified a lot. So. Let me start uh, by, by just really, really just to re refresh, you know, our, the different background of our panelists. And this is the diversity on the background and, the, and also the, the fact that they come, you know, from academia, from private sector, from government sector, uh, and also from uh, association that are powering women. This is, will, uh, I think it will be, uh, again, bring the diversity into the conversation, the power of the diversity when it comes to uh, bring uh, wonderful uh, stories. So 
the panel will be mostly about the uh, challenges, as, as I said, but also about the opportunity. So when it comes to opportunity, probably I would like to start to say that and to share some of my experience as an Accenture. Accenture is a, is a, is a big multinational company, more than 700,000 employees around the world. And we have been always very bold about gender equality. And I've probably been gifted in Accenture to, you know, to, to look at the, you know, the bold commitment that we have. And our, for example, our board at the, at the, is 50-50. So we have pretty much parity in terms of gender equality. And, and also in terms of ethnicity, we are around 60% of different ethnicity, which is definitely amazed. And uh, we have been trying to support also our executives and our, our women in the hiring. We are 50% of hiring female talent. But again, that we are uh, probably together with many of our companies, those are four, Fortune 500 companies around the world, we are definitely together with them uh, uh, sharing the same importance of the, uh, the agenda of, our, of having inclusion and diversity. But at the same time, we want to acknowledge also some of the challenges that we still have. So uh, we're going to start with that topic and uh, we're going to be listening from our, our panelists, which have been the challenges that they faced. And, um, and Mariam, if you don't mind, I'm going to start with you. Uh, Mariam is uh, the Chief Governance Officer at Red Sea Global. She's definitely reached a, a very senior role in this uh, very big organization in Saudi Arabia. And, uh, and we would like to hear from, from Mariam, which have been the struggles that she faced to reach that position, but also which have been, you know, what, what did you do actually to overcome that, you know, that challenges? Mariam, to you. Thank you, Francesca. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. I know there's people dialing in from all around the world. Um, so look, the whatever what the the notes that Hulud made really resonate with me a lot, uh, having uh, grown up in Saudi Arabia and seeing the transformation firsthand. Uh, I think one story that kind of demonstrates uh, the struggle for me and, 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 and in governance specifically, in 2012, uh, I came back to Saudi after a while living abroad, and I was working for PricewaterhouseCoopers. And at the time, not only PwC, but all the offices in, in, in Saudi were segregated. And so months into the job, I, um, well, from day one, I, I chose, uh, elected to sit at my own risk in the men's section. Months into my job, we got inspected. Uh, the office had to pay a fee uh, because, the, you know, they were in violation. The partner, the managing partner said, it's okay, don't worry about it. They came back again and inspected. I was the reason why they were getting fined and they were tolerating, they were not, not being compliant. Um, but then I made a very big argument to my team and to my male colleagues. And my argument was that unless we all sit in the same space, women are disadvantaged, especially the younger uh, colleagues that we have, because they're missing out on super important conversations. Yes, we do go to the client together as mixed teams. But in the office, when you're printing a paper or filling up your cup between meetings, that's when anecdotal casual conversations happen. And some of those anecdotal conversations are so important because it's just, you know, a thought that comes to a partner's mind or a debrief after a meeting coming back from the client. And it's a learning opportunity that's missed. It's actually even an opportunity to go with the partner or the person uh, project managing one of the files uh, to the uh, client. Uh, so, you know, you're going to look around you and say, hey, can you come to, with me? Uh, all of a sudden I have a meeting and it's more likely that it's a senior male colleague that's taking males around them because their females are sitting in another section down the aisle and you have to either make a phone call or walk towards them and, and, and call them. So it, it sounds very simple, but it was such a huge lost opportunity. We gradually started pulling out more females into the, the main space of the office. We were not in compliance. We had to take the risk, but there was a much bigger opportunity that was happening. We were the governance office. We were running governance uh, and we were building governance capability. How can we have our colleagues, the female colleagues, uh, miss out? 
So that was my initial uh, my my initial uh, experience. Uh, unfortunately for all of us, 2016, the new um, Vision 2030 and strategy for Saudi Arabia was published, and everything just started changing one thing after the other. So that all became history. I still walk into my office today with a smile, looking at all the male and female colleagues just getting on with work and and and. And, and also, luckily, I have uh, a lot of females. I tend to always find uh, that the best fit, at least for me, um, uh, team members in governance and in risk and in compliance tend to be women because they are just more methodical. They enjoy this type of practice. And so uh, it's been really, uh, really a good kind of um, career uh, building, but also I think uh, for for my my team members, uh, there was a part in the beginning. So 2017, we had a lot of new projects coming up, and we needed to build the pipeline for governance professionals. And one of the things I institutionalized and made sure that was there very early on was certifi certifying and training my my team. And I think uh, Jane was one of the people I reached out to the GCCBDI. Uh, we sent uh, and we continue to send uh, team members to get certified, whether they're certified as board secretary, certified board secretaries or governance professionals, or certified in, in, in other uh, certification programs. Risk and compliance is all about certification. And that's really what helps kind of build the pipeline and ensure that the females are as trained or even better qualified uh, than the males that are out there. So that's kind of been my, my experience overall. The challenges were there, thankfully, with regulation and also preparing the pipeline. We've been able to really be ahead of the game, at least in the GRC field. Um, and then maybe I'll just end to give others uh, an opportunity. I would also say that I've been very fortunate uh, that uh, I've been nominated always by male colleagues, uh, some in my own work, uh, my own age group, and but mostly with elder male colleagues, which I really appreciate to sit on boards and, and committees. I would also uh, agree with Khulud that it's often the females that don't nominate and pull other females up, and I have never been nominated by a female uh, to sit on a board or a committee until now, and I sit on about 12. So. I think there's a lot that we as women can do, not only as mothers in how we raise our girls and boys, but also in team leaders on how we ensure that there's the right uh, mix uh, of gender and the right treatment of uh, the females and the right promotion and, and encouragement for more females uh, to, to, to really uh, rise up to, to bigger positions and new positions and, and, and leadership positions. I'll pause there to give everyone else an opportunity to speak. Thanks a lot, Mariam. I think uh, you are absolutely right. I mean, the, um, the importance to have men ally, and we have Excellency Abdulati today. That he's definitely one of you know big sponsor and advocate advocacy for he's doing a lot of advocacy for women. At the same time, as you said, and I think Rude said the same, and actually she uh, uh, she is uh, also action like that. The um, we shouldn't underestimate the importance of women supporting women, right? So I think this is this is very important. I recall uh, I read a very interesting research and study from Harvard on uh, on the fact that sometimes women actually they 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 prevent they may end up to prevent uh, to have women rising because there are so few. Um, seats at the top level for women, that this is somehow is a, is a consequence, right? We are victim of not being able to support because of this. So I was, I was amazed about this research because I was not even realized that this may happen, right? So no, thanks a lot. And uh, I think I, I already anticipated I would like to listen from, uh, from one of our, from our uh, men in the panel. Uh, Excellency Abdulatit, and thanks for being with us today. Actually, you are chairman and also chairman of the GCC BDI, and um, and you are, you know, be, I think everyone went through your bio, your amazing career uh, that you're having and you had in, uh, in Saudi Arabia, but also internationally. So, Excellency, I would like to listen from you. Uh, you are definitely, you know, a well-established and respected leader, and We'd like to hear from you. Where do you think? What would you believe some of the challenges lie when it comes on having women on board? I mean, we recognize this is rising. We also recognize we are not at the 50-50, right? That we, we all want to be. 
what do you think? What do you, what do you believe is, is the main challenges that we're facing? Uh, thank you, Francisca. Uh, very delighted to be here. And first, uh, I would like to uh, congratulate Jane and uh, Kamla and your other colleagues from the other four uh, uh, directors' institutes uh, for pulling together such a wonderful uh, program. I think it's timely and uh, a great topic to, to, to address. Uh, I feel very privileged to be with you all, and uh, I want to thank Khaloud. I think Khaloud uh, have outlined a fantastic, uh, you know, lay of the land in Saudi Arabia. Uh, she uh, spoke in, in a very uh, uh, candid and truthful manner about what is happening and the challenges. Uh, like Kamla mentioned, there were lots of gems, Khaloud, and in, 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 in what you said uh, uh, and we all have benefited from what you said. Thank uh, you so much. It's, it's going to be very hard for me to really uh, avoid not uh, reiterating what Khaloud said and, and what uh, Maryam also uh, have said. Uh, we have uh, such a great representation here. Um, in in my mind, so I want to I want to talk about this uh, this important topic. Uh, my first uh, message is that this is really a global event. Uh, and it is a global uh, challenge that we are all facing. It's not unique to Saudi Arabia. It's not unique to the GCC. The subject of women in leadership and women empowerment and women in boards is a global challenge. And we have to recognize that there is an unconscious bias that we are facing. And it is the product of many centuries of male dominated businesses and uh, sectors. So there is this unconscious bias, whether we like it or not, it is there. And what we need to do is to really, in a smart way, de-bias it. Uh, that's, that's, that's what needs to be done. And everybody wants to work uh, towards it and we need to work collectively uh, on it. When I say unconscious uh, bias is just take the simple um, exercise of nominating people on the board. The first thing people do they look for their lookalikes. They look for people that are familiar to them. So where do you go? Uh, naturally, you're gonna go and look for your colleagues or your family and friends and all that. So unless, unless we address that thing by introducing uh, some uh, deliberate ways of uh, disclosure, uh, of uh, identifying, uh, uh, the subject of diversity, it's not going to happen. So uh, number one is we have to recognize that this is a global uh, challenge, that there is unconscious bias. Second, uh, there is a time lag, and we have to recognize that uh, women, introducing women in leadership position is only recent, and not only in Saudi Arabia, throughout the world. And there is a time lag, and we have to accelerate that. Uh, we have to, to find ways to accelerate preparing women in, uh, to such uh, positions. Um, uh, the third, uh, on, on boards, the nomination process still lacks objectivity. Uh, we, ha we have to recognize that. The nomination process, as much as uh, you know, we, we like to think it is objective, it, it does lack objectivity and Working on, on the nomination process also, uh, if you are on board, uh, would, would help address that. Uh, you know, I, I don't like the stereotypes. So I don't want to talk about, you know, lack of confidence. I know some of you mentioned it. Uh, I, I, I don't uh, subscribe uh, to the stereotypes. I think if anybody that you put them uh, in a challenging situation, they will rise to the challenge and you know you have to believe in the people that you nominate so in, in terms of challenges i think these are these are the key things the unconscious bias the time lag and then and the need to accelerate and prepare more uh, and make them ready thanks a lot i think this is this is so true. I mean, we have been in Accenture, we've been doing also a lot of research in terms of, you know, if we leave things like they are, but the time that we're going to reach the 50% the, the is going to take so many years, right? So the, the call 
in terms of accelerating or, or how we call it, reinventing ourselves as, as a business, the way we do it, I think is essential. Otherwise, we are not going to get there. And what does it mean? Apart from doing the good things and the right things, I think it's also not being innovative in the way that a diversity will bring innovation. You need to accelerate innovation as well. So I guess all these ingredients will, you know, talks a lot about there is something that needs to be done and very, very quickly. So thanks a lot. And I agree with the stereotypes. And uh, you have been saying that, you know, a lot say we, we should just act on facts and not necessarily go into the uh, stereotypes. So uh, I know we, you know, we, 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 we understand that confidence somehow and the fact that women uh, lack confidence could be a stereotype. It's also true that at least based on my experience, and I, I must, I'm a big, one of the global sponsors and faculty across Accenture of, um, of our flagship program. It's called Insight. We, uh, we bring along in our executive um, uh, program female talents of more, more than 500 senior managers across the world. And I was, uh, I was um, pretty much amazed on the fact that the, uh, one of the first questions that we ask to our women that are our best performers around the world. And uh, we ask the question, do you want to become managing director, which is the top level in Accenture organization? And, um, and you feel like, well, they're going to say, yes, I, we have to talk about best performer, female talents, and they are part of the program. And I was actually very surprised that I wouldn't say many of them, but pretty much a good number of them, they say no. And we asked that question the very, very beginning, and we asked this of the program, and we asked the same question at the end of the program, and actually the answer is different. So there is a lot of, uh, you know, training awareness, and we call it also self-limiting belief, probably it's confidence or probably self-limiting belief that I can not, I'm not able to do it because of number of self-limiting belief, right? So, so, and now I want to actually talk about this self-limiting belief, uh, the lack of courage also, Clude said the same about, you know, uh, getting to the change. And I want to hear actually from Mina. Uh, I, I'm sure you read, you know, the bio of Mina. Mina has been one of the first women head of the country in the banking sector. And I can talk, I think, about her, you know, her career and your, and actually your current career in uh, sitting the board of many companies in different industries. So, so Mina, what I would like to talk with you is. Probably it's a very simple question. I mean, how did you get there? How you were, <laughs> you were able to be selected um, uh, at the time? If I remember it was, if I'm not mistaken, in 2002, 2000, that you said you were selected at, you know, in, the, in that role. So how, how you were able to get there? Well, hello everyone thanks francesco what an honor to join my fellow panelists this morning or this afternoon um sharing my experience climbing the corporate ladder initially at scotia bank um i was very very aware of the what is called the double burden being a young young mother at the time um with very strong career goals so Initially, what I did was to focus on myself, got an MBA, got all the accreditation required in banking and, you know, made sure I was enrolled in all the leadership development programs, really always making sure I was properly uh, competent for the job, but also preparing myself for each interaction. Uh, I worked very hard, uh, I would say harder than my counterparts who were all men at the time and truly delivered outstanding results. So that was the beginning. Um, you know, th this caught the attention of my supervisors, my managers, who really at the time were all men and clearly saw beyond gender. Um, they soon identified me as a high potential leader and provided the exposure, the cross training, the mentorship um, needed to advance in my career. So you may say I was a poster child, a poster girl. 
Then I was appointed the country head for the Bahamas, the first woman country head in the Scotiabank ecosystem. So with that, my confidence grew, my skills grew. I worked very hard, as I mentioned earlier. And eventually I was accepted by my peers, not just my peers, but also the board, because I was then going to board meetings. I got sponsorship from the board level. And that's very important. Oftentimes we talk about having a mentor, but for me, the sponsor was so much more important. Some, someone who believed in you, believed in your capabilities and skills and helped to uh, take you up that ladder. You know, there are a number, um, I think Scotiabank at the time broke the cycle, broke the stereotype of barriers or obstacles that prevented women from rising to leadership positions. They provided role models within the organization and outside, and, and they provided an executive coach in 2002. You know, that was unheard of in most organizations. So they really changed the institutional mindsets which you know, saw women being elevated to senior positions. And it was the same thing for women and men. Um, for my sake, I, I widened my network. Um, I, I, I was then selected for the job based on not just gender, but the right man for the job, which at the time was a woman, myself. It was very important because Scotiabank provided that continuous learning and training, including board appointments across the region. So, you know, from that early stage, you were, learn you were, you were taught how to manage the board, understand the culture and benefited from that significantly. So I, I think I was very fortunate to be in an organization that, you know, really saw beyond gender. We're looking for the best skills the best person for the job, but more so providing the environment for you to succeed. No, thanks a lot, Mina. And, and I think the sort, I mean, you, the ingredients were definitely there, right? You know, very high potential talent and then uh, in an organization that foster and probably were very, you know, meaningful, right? On what they want to do and when it comes to diversity and talents. And if you don't mind, Mina, Another question for you in terms of your current um, positions, actually you are sitting in different boards in, uh, in different industries. Have you seen actually any patterns, patterns when, um, you know, in, in those, you know, industries and some of these industries we may say are male dominated? Well, you're, you're so right, Francesca. Um, presently, I'm, I've retired from corporate life. I now serve on about seven boards, you know, about three, three of them are listed companies. The others are privately owned. Um, I also serve on some independent commissions for the government. So different patterns, you are correct. There I was leaving a banking en environment and being asked to serve on an energy company. Granted, they were my customers before. So I had an understanding of the industry, but not in-depth knowledge. And that's one of the fears I find. A lot of us tend to, if we don't have 100% knowledge or understanding of the company and the industry, we tend to not accept the appointment. But I was fearless and I thought, mm, this is a way to continue learning. So I accepted the position and man, it was a, it was a steep learning curve. So, so what I did was really making sure that I I ask the right questions. You know, um, you went in and you met with management who, you know, you were exposed to. Um, I listened, I connected with the board members as well. Spent all, a lot of time understanding the culture. And, you know, I'm, I'm a very assertive and direct person. I had to temper that. I had to bring a little charm into um, my, the way I asked questions, you know, rather than making strong suggestions, because that didn't go over well with the men, you can imagine. Um, so very soon they understood the, 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 the skills that I brought to the table, which is mainly from the banking sector. You know, um, someone earlier mentioned um, 
I was on the I chair of the audit committee right away because they need that expertise. But by doing that, they recognize my capabilities. So very soon, um, I was the point of reference. I was sitting on other boards so I could bring other information and learnings and best practices to that board as well. So um, it was a balancing effort though. It was, a, it was a lot of time commitment. I think I spent probably three times the amount of time that the men spent in preparing for a board meeting, but I was well prepared when I got there. And, and you got the respect for that. Um, what I found though, is as I compared the energy sector, we'd say the banking sector, which I was coming from. Initially, I found I was digging too deep into operational issues at the banking level. You know, you're supposed to be very strategic as a, as a director, but because I knew it so well, I would always want to be asking the questions and making suggestions from my experience. And that's something I learned to very quickly understand your role as a director and know it's different from management and don't go, and we women tend to go very deep. We're very detailed. We want to know everything. So that was a big learning for me going into an industry that I knew was very familiar with versus one very new. But it's a matter of gaining the, exp um, the respect of your, of your team. I'll share with you, you know, one of the things that I grappled with initially, I would make a very excellent point and I knew it was well researched and there would be no response. Five minutes later, a man would say the same thing and wow, what a great suggestion. I'm saying, what the hell? So you have to manage that as well. You know, now I'll say, but didn't you hear my point earlier? But then I was just so frustrated in understanding that they didn't take me as seriously as they took the other the men. But now I've gained their respect. So it took a, it's, it's a long, steep curve, um, but a lot of learning experiences. No, thanks, Mina. And definitely, I think it resonates with many of us about, you know, you give a comment, you, know, but <laughs> you, 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 you feel like you're not heard, right? And then actually somebody else take it. Yeah, I mean, that happened to me a um, few times, actually. Um, the, um, but what I want to actually uh, take from what you just said uh, is the power of unlearning. I, you know, we have been actually in Accenture, we have been discussing a lot about this because with such a fast changing that we have, right? I mean, the, the world is definitely, we all recognize and, and the power of unlearning relies also on the ability that you have to, that you are able to transform and actually to change and take the courage. So I, I, I think that if you end up into a position where actually you want to use all your history and then actually you need to unlearn because otherwise you know you're not able to you know to to deal with the new with the new role so thanks a lot i i you know talking about you know the um, uh, the confidence and the learning and the one of i think i i one of the um, leadership DNA, I call it, and the value, which is about lead with excellence that you just said. I would like actually now to talk with Rowena that she's definitely showing her career, you know, a, a, a leading with excellence um, DNA in her, uh, in, her, in her current role, in, her, in all her career. Rowena, to, I would like to hear from you um, how the... Um, uh, you know, how the confidence, and I know in, in, in the chamber, uh, in the women chamber, you are, uh, you are leading a program which is about building the confidence for women and women empowerment. Can you tell us more about this program and how you are working through and together with many companies uh, about, uh, about women empowerment? Right. Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, Thank you for the opportunity to represent the Ghana and Women's Chamber at this forum. Um, so I think much of what uh, the previous um, panelists would have mentioned, but specifically to the Ghana context, the, the Chamber, uh, it's one of the, actually the only in the region. So it's the only Women's Chamber in the region. And here in Ghana, we have a few chambers, um, which is Georgetown Chamber and some regional chambers. And so those are a bit older than the women's chambers. So we are fairly new. 
Um, so the, the idea and the vision behind the chamber is similar as you mentioned. Um, uh, we are focused as well on a lot of entrepreneurship, but because it's women in business, we also have a scope for women in corporate. Um, because again, not everybody will be venturing into business ownership, but rather um, leading businesses, getting into the CEO's position, the C-suite goals that persons may have. Um, so for us, that entails a lot of, as you know, the question speaks to confidence, a lot of confidence building. It's just a case where um, the, 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 I don't want to use the term bias, but for the want of a better word, the biases of before of what, the role that women played, um, it's changing, of course, globally. Um, and one of the things that we've done or we continue to do is to use the examples uh, or the live examples of women who have succeeded in their corporate roles here in Guyana. So when we have events, um, one of the things that we have, a signature event of the chamber is the Ghana Women and Girls Summit, which is of course focused around International Women's Day within that, that realm of that celebration. We use that time to highlight women, not just in business ownership, but of course women who've excelled and uh, uh, moved up the ladder in organizations who are now sitting at the managing director and the CEOs of these firms or conglomerates here in Guyana. Um, and, and using their stories to encourage and um, showcase to the women of Guyana and to the younger girls. And I think one of the, one of the aims and, and one of the focus and I, where I think we ought to start is we need to hit the persons who are younger in the schools. Um, you know, you have to start building that confidence and showing what's out there um, as it relates to role or biases, as it gender roles, um, career goals and roles that women can play in their um, in their lives in terms of what they want to study, what they want to pursue. So that's where we start. The last um, the last event that we had, we we currently have the the head of the of SLB, which is rebranded Slumberger, rebranded to SLB, is a woman in Guyana. Um, you know, and she's managing Guyana, Trinidad, and the Caribbean. And so having persons like that speak to our, our audience um, and feature in our um, events, just to bring them to light and showcase what they've done, all the same issues and challenges that they face, but then they have tips to give to us that they've overcome. You know, how did they manage through all of that? Um, and so as mentioned before, the support is needed in that way. Um, one of the things that we also engage in is definitely trying to start the conversation and participate in the conversation of intentional hiring or intentional um, promotion of women. I think somebody just mentioned the fact of you, brought, you bring the persons into the company um, and then you're able to see them grow. So the idea is if you identify um, you identify these, these young women um, in your company through the hiring process, and you think that you find something that you can grow and you can build out of them, then I think you ought to invest in that. And, and companies ought to understand that that's something that we groom and we grow persons into these roles. You just don't wake up one day and say, I'm going to be a CEO without being trained and understanding that you have to be um, certified, as Mina mentioned. You know, so showing somebody that that is also that I believe in you as your as your employer. I think um, we bring those out of the, the big corporates here in Guyana um, and to have that conversation. I've had a conversation that struck me um, someone and, you know, when I brought, I brought this specific point up where I said, you know, I, we need to be a bit more intentional. Let's hire, we have, we don't have somebody in the company at the time, but let's, when we're hiring, maybe, intentionally say we're looking for a female to fill this head of department role. It's not difficult to find. People headhunt all the time. Um, you know, and the question was raised, well then I'll be I'll be probably shorting some some other person out of a job or out of an opportunity. Like not necessarily because you know there are women out there. You're just being a little bit more intentional with the hire. Um, so that's one of the things that we we are also focusing on, or we try to have that conversation going, is to be intentional in your process um, of promotions and your hiring. When you're filling these roles of, of, of leadership, heads of departments, managers, supervisors um, with females. And 
Supports as well, coming back to support, I think one of the things we've been um, conscious of is there are persons out there and there are males out there who do believe that, for example, the Women's Chamber was created in some, in some sort of competitive way, but it's not. Um, everybody has challenges, whether they're in corporate, whether they're trying to become an entrepreneur and build a business. The only difference is that women have unique challenges that, that men wouldn't face. And so the idea is to have a group or a, a collective voice that can advocate for those unique challenges, as opposed to, well, we have everybody going for the general challenges, access to financing, more collaborative efforts, um, capacity building. And even in capacity building itself, whether it's for your leadership role in corporate or you're trying to lead in your organization, you're, you're building your business, it's still different as it relates to how we train women. Because as, as mentioned before, we do as women also have to unlearn certain things um, and then relearn how to position ourselves. So for us, the idea of collaboration and support from our male counterpart is extremely important. All the females uh, are many females out there. We have families, uh, we have kids, we have husbands and partners who we, we have to ask to support us as we try to build a business or as we try to head for that CEO position, it will take um, the, the, the efforts of, of a family, which means if you're married or you have a partner, you're a partner. So that's also where um, I come across a lot of uh, males who said, you know, you know, uh, I support I support my wife in, in, in this venture and I know that she can do it. So I try to take some of the some of the, um, the tasks, whether it's at home or running some errands so that she can focus on certain things. And that's one of the ways we also um, try to have that collaboration with our male counterparts, just so that they understand. And once they understand that, it's easy to get their support in what we're trying to do. Yeah. No, thanks a lot. That's definitely true, right? I mean, being intentional and also recognize the differences, which actually this is all about, right? Having the diversity, which bring the right, you know, innovation and changes that are required, which is, um, in, you know, you know, are uh, able to you know grow the business and uh, and also the uh, I think the agenda of the organization. Uh, so thanks, Rowena. And thinking about the initiative, I would like to and being also intentional, I would like to uh, listen from Etisam, Dr. Etisam. Um, Dr. Etisam, you are an influential leader at Emirates Center for Strategic Studies and Research. And you receive support from your government. We would like to listen from you. Um, what has been your experience? And also to listen, which are the initiatives that you, actually you are part of it and you have been you know, driving uh, in the uh, government agenda regarding uh, policy and, and making sure that women take uh, the lead in the public sector in UAE. So UAE is also leading, I mean, similar to Saudi Arabia, wants to really bring women into the public sector. And uh, you, are, uh, uh, you are definitely witnessing them being part of this. Can, can you share some of your um, experience about, about that? What a wonderful opportunity to be with you all today. I'm still processing and reflecting on Khulud's significant voice in today's space and my fellow panelists. Believe me, the unlearning and the relearning that is happening today is really huge in my experience. I wish I can just distance myself and just like keep reflecting, noting down and, you know, just like reshare my voice at a later stage, but it's my moment now. So going back to your question, Francisca, um, just um, reflecting on my lived experience, I would say I'm still the only woman at the decision making table. When I look around me, all I see is men, but I am the loudest. And I have so much influence over the decision-making process. Maybe before I joined the uh, the um, the organization or before I joined the Emirates Center for Strategic Studies and Leadership, they were living at a traditional uh, stage. They wanted a freshness. They wanted a new uh, voice uh, to come to the table so it can bring 
more innovation and creativity uh, to the uh, process and to the operations itself. So when I would say who is my greatest supporter and sponsor, I would uh, go back and refer to my boss, um, Dr. Sultan al naimi and he's a man. So I don't have a different conversation than what my Saudi fellows shared in today's space. Men are our biggest supporter here in the Gulf countries. That's why every time I look at the literature or I participate or I sit in classes internationally, I tell them I bring a different narrative. They come and they tell me, Ibtisam, maybe you come from a privileged and maybe you have the access to the government. I tell them, even when I look down at the people who does not have the same access and the same opportunity, I would say there should be um, you know, a different narrative that you should listen to when you come to the Gulf countries. So when I speak of my leadership journey, I would say it's quite unusual because I was headhunted during a brainstorming session when I was invited to participate um, um, in a brainstorming session for a big national project, which I end up leading later on, which is of a significant honor because it is about bringing men and women and promote their um, knowledge, promote their intellectuality, not only on a local um, level, but also um, international level. So the message that I wanted to bring to the table is that when people look at my profile from the outside, they assume that my leadership education is what landed me on my leadership role, but there is more uh, to this than just a, an education or like an, an empowerment program or a mentorship that one should go through. Number one thing is networking and sponsorship opportunities. And this is uh, building on Mina's um, um, contribution here at this space. Um, if there is one thing that I brought back with me from the States is the art of networking and making myself visible into the space because without bringing yourself to the space, no one is going to know about you. Competence is really important, but it's not enough at the senior level. You need a network that endures you, connect you, and bring your voice to the table because the quota could bring you to the table, but if you don't have the right networking and you don't have the right mentors and sponsor who can bring and offer you a space, for you to grow. And as you said, Mina, um, you have to gain that respect in order for you to have your voice and to be invited and for people to listen to you and to take you uh, for granted. So when you have a seat at the table, you have to speak up for yourself. You have to get involved and to take more leadership responsibility. Uh, because I would say we as women, uh, sometimes we try to, um, uh, you know, take a step back and not to promote ourselves. We lack a branding. So with making more visibility to ourselves and bringing ourselves and taking more responsibility, I would say branding is happening here and branding is the most important thing along with networking and sponsorship opportunities. Thanks, Edisam. That's so true, right? So with the network and the power of network is definitely there. And at least myself, I need to learn a lot on that. You know, I think I, I read a very interesting book. Uh, I don't know if you know that women, how women rise. Uh, and actually we're mentioning the fact that we as a woman, we're very good on building network, but we're not very good on leveraging network, which is actually a very good reflection, right? I think Crude uh, said, go and ask. <laughs> many of you said go and ask ask help ask to learn ask to unlearn and so and i'm sure that you know jane and, Ka and karam know that you know how they are bringing you know the importance of network also through this initiative and so no thanks a lot and i would like actually now talking about network and talking about initiative to listen from Excellent, Abdul Latif, about the initiative that GCCBDI is promoting to encourage women, and and also what do you think uh, can you know can help more and more for you know improving board diversity? You already touched a little bit on that. Uh, I would like to link with the with the initiative, and 
in order to you know understand for example if uh, you know leveraging network is something that you believe you know we need to learn a little bit more uh, uh, to rise as a woman uh, maybe before we talk about the initiatives uh, and what gcc bdi is doing uh, allow me uh, maybe to outline what i think needs to be done uh, to address uh, the issues that we've heard about uh, first, I think we need to recognize that we have success stories and we have to build on the successes and build on this great momentum. And if you look at what is happening in the Gulf and not just Saudi Arabia, we have many success stories and, you know, uh, females when given the chance have risen up to the challenge and we feel very proud of it. And we have to really leverage, leverage that and, and promote it. Uh, num num number two, and this is where research, I think, can help, uh, we need uh, to demonstrate that good governance and corporates with diversity are better performers, and hence you can command a premium on your stock price and maybe lower your cost of debt. Um, and and uh, because at the end of the day, it all has to make good business sense. And not, we're not doing it just for the sake of doing it. It really makes good business sense. Uh, third, uh, we really need to work on de-biasing the organizations and not just the people. And by that, I mean, um, we need to uh, institutionalize uh, diversity and identification of talent um, throughout the organization. Uh, by that, I mean, on debiasing the organization, I am, I don't, uh, by the way, believe in the quota. And I was very happy with what Khaloud articulated on the, you know, the, the pros and cons of uh, the two schools on this. Uh, uh, from my experience, uh, quotas uh, could backfire. However, you shouldn't just leave it to the status quo. And hence, a, a smart intervention is needed. And you need somebody to uh, make that uh, change. And this is where the regulators, in a very smart way, can work with leading organizations on introducing uh, females uh, to the boards. And seeing is believing. And, and if you do this, it, you know, it, it will create the positive momentum. Uh, another approach. Uh, is that you actually demand the transparency in the nomination process. You know, how many have you looked at that are females when you, when you, when you looked at the board nomination or even for, for executive position? And if you look at many, many research would say that the mere uh, fact of asking people uh, to highlight whom they've considered from the minorities or from uh, females, uh, that by itself will lead to the right nomination uh, process. Uh, third, uh, we really need to work hard on accelerating the development, the training, the mentorship, and as uh, Mina mentioned, the sponsorship, because uh, sponsorship is not just mentorship, sponsorship is believing in, in the individual and, and helping them. So we need to accelerate it. And fourth, I, this is a message to people, uh, whether you're you know, young, uh, male or female, really make yourself viable. Think, think like you are being rehired every day and develop your skills. Uh, uh, you know, at the end of the day, private sector or businesses want to make sure that you know, if they pay you a dollar, uh, they will make from you two dollars or three dollars. So develop your skills and sharpen them and earn your seat. Um, even if there is a quota, even if there is a push by the country or by the organization, uh, you know, just make sure that you, you earn it and not to just take uh, the wave because uh, you could hurt yourself and hurt others uh, if you don't do the right job of preparing yourself. So to summarize, you know, I, you know, build on, on the success. We need to promote that it makes good business sense. 
We need uh, to devise the organization, accelerate the development, and individually, we need to sharpen our skills. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. So definitely, I think this is really brings somehow to, you know, many of the concepts that, you know, we have, you know, we have been heard during our session and also to include. Um, and and, and later, maybe and later I can talk about what the GCC BDI is doing, but maybe to continue yes. the conversation. Yes, we can continue because I think uh, Jane and Klama, we have, uh, we are pretty much on top of the hour, right? So we're running a little bit on time and I want to understand if we want to leave a little bit of at least a couple we, of minutes for questions. On, on the GCC BDI, we are, we are actually uh, promoting women in, in leadership and women on boards. We have special programs uh, that are, and workshops that are being developed, but we're also working with regulators. We have very, very supportive and progressive regulators, especially in Saudi Arabia, who really want to accelerate uh, the preparation and the readiness of females uh, and in, 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 uh, on board. So we're doing exciting work. We're, some of it is still in its early stages, but I, you know, um, we're very happy with what is, uh, what is happening in the kingdom and in the GCC on this uh, issue. Yeah. Um, Francesca, I think if you um, perhaps take some questions, because you've got questions on the Q&A um for your panelists particularly maybe five minutes um because we need to also follow on with sharon um who's due on at the hour okay um yeah, Kamla, do you want to skip the questions for now and come back to them after sharon's session yes i was thinking that that may be a good idea because a lot of this is such wonderful information and i think a lot of persons are going to want to engage so Francesca, I'd, I'd be very happy to share that, that spot with you after Sharon is finished, that we can help in ensuring that we address a, a lot of the, the questions that um, persons have. Yeah, definitely. I think it, may, it makes definitely a lot of sense. So we can, we can do that. And so I want to, you know, sum, sum up a little bit of our session. And so if I, if I can, probably just mention a few words in terms of what we've been heard and then probably making a list like like it is said, you know, I need to reflect. So I was taking note on the reflection. So um, sponsoring, sponsoring, transparency, art of network, good governance, courage of change, acceleration and those are probably some of the words that I will take as a, my takeaway for reflection. And, and with that, I want to thanks all the amazing panelists today that have been sharing their experience. And I will, uh, I, I definitely been, you know, I'm gifted, everybody has been gifted to hear from you and, uh, and they've been very, very useful for everyone. So thanks a lot. And, and Kamla, back to you for the next, for the next session. Yes. Thank you so very much, Francesca, and to all of our panelists. This really was um, such a tremendous amount of um, learnings for me in particular, even, and I'm in this field already. So I'm, I'm really excited about how we are going to be able to engage the conversation with all of you in a little bit. But I'm also very keen to be able to introduce Sharon for her to share um, some of her learnings and experiences with us, because Sharon is really also one of our gems in the Caribbean. She, she is the uh, founder and CEO of Sharon Christopher and Associates. You know, as we would have shared in the agenda, she's a leadership development coach, a motivational speaker, and an attorney at law. For many years, she was in fact the only woman in an executive team which successfully led the merger of three indigenous banks in Trinidad and Tobago, which occurred during an economic downturn and was able to contribute to this merged institutions, which is the first citizens bank into a financial powerhouse in the Caribbean region as it operates in five of our jurisdictions here in the Caribbean and Latin America. Sharon has a particular interest in developing women for leadership roles and, and we were very, very happy that she agreed to be part of today's conversation. Just to give a little more context, 
she um, has held or continues to hold directorships in over 30 boards in both public, private, and even in the NGO sectors here in the region and also in international companies. She's currently the chair of the Campus Council of the St. Augustine Campus of the University of the West Indies. The, the council, of course, is the governing body for the campus, and she's the very first woman to hold this position. Um, she was granted the award of fellow of the Institute of Banking and Finance in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, in 2020, she was recognized as an eminent pioneering Caribbean woman jurist by the Caribbean Court of Justice, which by the way, I should say she graduated as the most outstanding student when she completed her legal education certificate at the Hewitt and Law School. And uh, in 2021, in the National Awards for Trinidad and Tobago, she was given the country's highest, uh, second highest award, which is the Shaconia Medal Gold for Business, Banking, Finance, and Leadership. So, um, so much that I know Sharon is going to be able to bring and add to our conversation. So Sharon, we welcome you and I want to invite you to take the virtual podium and share your insights with us. Well, thank you, thank you, Kamla. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. And Kamla, it's really my honor to be, to be talking here today and to be part of this. I was, this morning's um, proceedings, the, the contributions made by the speakers before me was really very enlightening, but interesting, what is more interesting to me, it touched on many things that I will also touch on in my presentation, but it said to me that my assessment of the situation is correct. I mean, there are global issues that affect women. It doesn't matter which part of the world that we are in. So I thank the Caribbean Corporate Governance Institute for asking me to join it. One thing I want to say, though, you know, I'm always asked, sometimes I'm talking in, in, in you know, to a women's workshop, sometimes I'm coaching, and women always say to me, but well, why is it important for me to, to even bother to go through the hassle of being on a board or getting into the C-suite or, you know, all those things? And I always have to explain to them, and it was brought out very, very clearly for me in Kalud's presentation, is that if you do not have a seat on the table, you cannot pull out a chair for anybody else. It is why Kalud has been able to help other women. It's why you heard what Miriam had to say in terms of, you know, being in a space and saying to women, we have to be in this space, because if we are not in this space, other people are getting opportunities we are not getting. It might be against the law, but we will continue pushing for it. And so I, I want to make that point to the audience sitting here today. It is, I'm not saying that every woman has to be in the C-suite or that every woman, but every woman should seek to be in some position of influence in which you can assist other women. This is critical for us to be able to move the woman's agenda. Having said that, I want to begin with a story. You know, back in 2014, but I might know, I can't remember, 2014 or 2015, I was in Atlanta, Georgia, and I met a woman called Ruby Bridges. Now, Ruby Bridges, at the age of six, became the first African-American to desegregate, to enter into a desegregated school. At that time in the United States, you know, Blacks and whites were segregated. And, and although Blacks, I call them Blacks, African-Americans were, were citizens like the whites, they were prevented from many of the rights that the white citizens had, whether it is the right to vote, whether it's the right to go to proper schools, medical care, and so on. And there was a lot of work done in the civil rights movement, and Dr. Martin Luther King was in the forefront of that. So there was Ruby. The, the Supreme Court had held that it was unconstitutional to segregate the schools, and therefore the schools must become desegregated. And Ruby's family took the decision that they would send their six-year-old daughter to a white school. Now, you can imagine at that time that she is going to school and every day the security forces had to come and they had to escort her to school. And some of you might have seen pictures of this little girl her hair in pigtails walking to school and through a sort of almost like a tunnel of people. And these people are cursing at her. They are spitting at her. They are throwing things at her, right? So imagine this is what a six year old is going through. So when this woman, when she gave the story, you know, I said to her, I said, but how did your parents, what did they say to you to allow this? Because she told me that when she left for school, her mother would pray for the entire day until she came back home. Okay. And so I said, but how did you, what did they say to you? And she told me that her parents told her that Dr. King, that's Dr. Martin Luther King, has done his part 
It is now up to us to do ours. Just think of that. Any of you who are mothers, if you have children, that they would do, and they were able to do that. And this little girl at seven was able to change the course of history. But why is this relevant for what we are discussing today? And again, some of the panelists and, and the feature speakers spoke to it. And it is this. There's a lot of work being done. It may not be enough, but it's being done in terms of moving the woman's agenda. There are laws being passed. We heard of what the tremendous things being done in Saudi, you know, and the movements that have taken place there. Mina talked about what was Scotia did back in the early 2000s that allowed her to get to where she was going. So there's no doubt that it's important for those things to be done. But it is also important for us, for us as women to understand that we have a responsibility. I think Kalud said it best. I think she said, when the doors are opening to push ourselves through. And so that it is that personal responsibility that I think is important. And sometimes it does get lost in the conversations. And I could tell you as a coach, primarily of females, a lot of times women, you know, sort of, it's like, well, they should do this and they should do that. And it comes back to, okay, so then what are you doing? So what I just want to talk to is what I some of the barriers that do exist that I see, and as I say, it might have been touched on earlier, but what are some of the kinds of things that we could do in that space when those barriers exist? How are the ways that we are able to help ourselves? And of course, I'm just in the time allotted, I could only talk about six barriers. And of course, they are not exhaustive. The list is not exhaustive, but it's sort of, you know, I just want to get the message across that we are not it's not a futile exercise. We are not powerless. True empowerment really talks about what we can do in order to help ourselves. So the first barrier, it has to do with our personal lives. And it is this. I have spoken to women in every part of the globe. And if it is one thing that is true is that women still bear the brunt of the home. They bear the brunt of children, they bear the brunt of seeing about the home, and they bear the brunt of age parents, depending on what age you're in. And that is a fact. And what that does is that when you have to deal with that and then deal with the office, you get to a stage in which you're able to say, I can't, I just can't do it anymore. And one or the other goes. And so the question is, if I'm a woman, what are some of the kinds of things that I could do? Now, I would speak a lot from a Caribbean context, but as I told you, you know, I, I do belong to, to groups in which I am able to have conversations with women in different spaces. One of the first things women need to consider, which sometimes I don't think we pay attention to, is what can I do to remove the burden on me of household task? Because a lot of times women don't want to ask for help. A lot of times women put up their hands and say, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. A lot of times women don't stand back and say, look, what am I really, are there things that I could do? And so one of the first things you can do is you can develop ways to remove the burden of the task. Now, that means that maybe you don't have to do every single thing. If you can afford it, maybe you can get house help. If you can afford it, you can get the other people in your home to be able to do things. And, you know, and you start looking, you start have to start looking at things like that, right? Now, because when you are, the other thing I've found, and we as women, we know this, when we are out there and there's so many things in the home and COVID really brought that home, eh? especially to women who have children of school age and they had to do that work from home thing. And I'll, I'll deal with that in a little while. But when you are doing all of these things, then resentment starts to build. And that resentment then spills over into the workforce because in the office too, we try to take on a whole set of things that, you know, contrary to what, you know, we can actually do because of the burdens at home. But when we learn to say, okay, no, as Oprah says, no is a complete sentence, when we're able to free ourselves and actually forcibly, intentionally look for ways that we could relieve that burden, then we take some kind of control. A few years ago, I was uh, speaking at a women's conference in, in one of the islands, I think it was Barbados. And I was saying the same thing. And when I was finished, a woman in the question and answer segment, she said, you know, I'm sitting here listening to you. And she said, every Sunday, my family, we go to church 
Uh, we come back from church and my husband sits in front of the TV and he looks at sports. And my kids go into the rooms, Kamala is nodding. <laughs> my kids go into the room and they are playing video games or they're on social media. And I go into the kitchen and I cook for two hours. In the Caribbean, Sunday lunch is a big thing, okay? So she said, I go and I cook for two hours and I feel, I have become to feel so resentful and I am just so tired and I have to start back work on Monday. And she said, you know, listening to you, I realize that there are many places in Barbados that sell lunch on a Sunday. And I commit now that I am going to make sure that every Sunday we will order food. And when we come home, everybody will eat and relax. You know, it's sound, these things are so simple, but they really are things that could help you become more effective. The other thing is important for women to understand as you try to release some of the household burden is everything does not have to be done your way. A lot of women say, and because I have worked so much with men, you know, I understand they say, you know, I try to do this, but then my wife says, or my partner says, or whatever, that I'm not doing it the right way, or it must be done at this time, and it must be this month, so why should I bother? And, and it's an important lesson to learn. And even within an office situation, I mean, this is not... A lot of times women want to do things the way that they do it, and then they become overburdened, and then they micromanage, and then all your staff are against you, and you can't understand what this is happening, and that you end up in burnout. Again, once I, in, in, I had a client in another island, I can't remember which, I think she was also in Barbados, and she told me that she went, she went away on business, and of course, the child stayed at home with the child's father. And when she came home, she's at the airport and there, and she's come out of arrival and the, the little girl sees her, the girl is about seven and she runs to, you know, mommy and, and she says, as the child is running towards her, she's saying to herself, look at her hair, you, her father couldn't comb her hair before he brought her to the airport. You know, and she said, then she stopped and she heard my voice that said, things don't have to be done your way, all right? So that's the first, your personal lives. And we have to be conscious of it and, and with intention decide what we're gonna do in our personal lives. The other thing is societal expectations around what, how a woman should be. You know, Mina talked about the fact that you get into a boardroom and she's in a very aggressive, well, aggressive is a pejorative term for many people, but there's nothing wrong with aggression. You know, that's a whole other topic, but anyway. And she realizes that she has to tone down. And society sort of says, this is how a woman should be. This is what a woman should, this is how a woman should behave. And sometimes women feel that, look, and I actually had a client that I was coaching recently who said to me, I am not sure if I want this senior level position because I don't want to become one of those women who is a, I would not say the word, but the B word, right? I don't want to become. And I said, well, why should you become? So she said, well, how else can I survive if I am not, you know, there and I'm fighting and this and that and the other, right? And so that... Um, what happens is people go like her, where they sort of say, I'm not going to take this position. And then there are all those who, when they take the position, they sit in the boardroom and they don't want to be confrontational in a boardroom. They don't want to speak up. They don't want when the men are talking over them, which happens. They, there's not a woman, I'm sure, on this earth who has sat in a boardroom and not have a man speak over her or a man say something after she has already said it and is accepted by the man. That's just what it is, you know. And we talked about unconscious bias, and it is very important for us to start to understand that sometimes those things happen. You need to understand that sometimes people are not even conscious of what they're doing and, and to release it. But what is insidious is sometimes that even we as women kind of almost accept that what is the appropriate way for a woman to behave because we have been conditioned by the very societies that the men have been conditioned by. So that, that, that sort of says to us, okay, fine. This is a way that we are required to behave. And we are not even conscious of the fact that we have been so negatively conditioned. And it's what I call the deleterious effect of negative conditioning. Because from the time we are born and we come out into this world, we hear messages about what a woman should be. And we have to be conscious of how is that really affecting my attitudes and behaviors? And what do I need to do in order to change it? And, you know, there's a whole, I mean, I do whole workshops around negative conditioning, but I'll just say quickly, you know, I always ask my clients, look, break your life down into five-year spans. 
And in each span, ask yourself, what is the message I receive? And their messages are wrong, women should be seen or not heard. Their messages are wrong. You know, you're pretty, so you don't have to work hard. You know, you would get a husband or you would get things. Their messages are wrong. You are the brightest person in a class and therefore you continue to be bright. And all those messages, but they affect you, especially women who are driven by this thing around perfection. So if you get messages that say to you what a woman should be, what a brilliant person should be, what kind of success you should have, and all those things, then you get into the workplace and you're fighting for that perfection and it just can't happen because nothing is perfect. And then it becomes now a barrier and it keeps holding you back for where you want to go, you know, for what it is that you need to be able to do. It's important, therefore, that you also establish relationships with women in similar positions. Again, and I know this is sensitive, but I say to women, everybody can have their friends. We all have friends and we have friends in, in who do different things. But the truth is, if you, there's a difference between friends and the people who can give you support in terms of your own professional life and so on. Because when you are, as a woman in the corporate world, which carries its own everything with it, and you're dealing with a woman, say, who may be a housewife and she's at home looking after her kids, and you sort of say to her, well, you know, I don't know what's happening now. I should go for this position. But if I go for this position, this is what will happen and so on. She might not understand because she is not in that game. So she doesn't understand the rules. You need to be surrounded by other women who are able to say to you, as we are doing here, this kind of sharing here, how it is helping is because people who are like us, it, and it doesn't matter which part of the world are able to look and say, well, yeah, you know, that's something you're saying. This is something I could learn from. Those things are critically important. And this is why like the work being done in Guyana with the Women's Chamber is so important. You have to be able to surround yourself with people who could help you. And of course, it's important, and we discussed it, finding both mentors and sponsors, because a mentor will do the same thing. And sometimes your mentor can be your sponsor. I sponsor women myself, and I mentor many. And I might mentor and sponsor a woman at the same time because the sponsor will sort of open up the doors to get. So if somebody calls you and says, you know, do you know anybody who can do this? I'm able to say, I know. I actually keep a list now. And when we talk about bias, let me just interject here. The reason why I keep a list of women is because two years ago, you heard time, just two years ago, we were in the middle of COVID. And I sat with three senior women in Trinidad and Tobago, senior corporate women. And we won a major organization was looking for a chairman. And we and a chair, I'm used with chairman without gender, just a chair of the corporation, publicly listed company. And we sat down and we started, we started saying, well, what about this? And then we suddenly stopped and realized, look, we are only considering men. We, these three women who have been out in the forefront. And we sort of said, what the hell are we doing? Why are we considering men? And that's only like two or three years, it was COVID, so say two years ago, that you have to deliberately sort of intentionally because you have the same unconscious bias that the men have. So you need to understand that in yourself. So the third barrier, and again, people talked about it, is being reluctant to take positions outside of your comfort zone. Perfection is something that destroys many of us as women, okay? Because we are terrified at the bare idea of not being perfect. So what happens is that we therefore, we build all this expertise, we become highly educated. I mean, I, I think education now, and certainly we've seen what's happening in Saudi and, and certainly education in the Western world, you know, women are being educated all the time and women are being given opportunities. And, but we are afraid and we become, so therefore we become and we get into these positions and we within our comfort zone. And then somebody says to you, well, you know, like many organizations now will say to you, I need you to be able to, to start taking on these other roles. And women immediately start to backtrack. And they start to say, well, listen, I am not fully qualified. And I think Mina touched on this. I am not fully qualified to be able to do this. And, and, and then they start saying, okay, fine. Maybe I can wait until I get the qualifications or wait until I get the experience and then I am going to be able to do this. And, but that, it does not work like that. You have to be able, you can only grow when you stretch yourself and you have to be willing to move on. And, you, and I mean, I entered banking 
as a lawyer, as a general counsel for a bank. That's where my love was in the law, my qualifications were in the law. I knew nothing about banking, I mean, apart from writing a check, you know. But I ended up as a deputy CEO with the entire operations and administration of the financial services group, the bulk of the group that, you know, people part of the group reporting into me. And it requires courage. And it requires the, the, the sort of being able to say to yourself that, you know, I could do anything. There's a, um, a man spoke to me, he's in an organization here in Trinidad. And he said, you know, Sharon, you all say all the time that, you know, give women opportunities. And he said, in my organization, I have tried. He said, I'm a CEO and I will look at people and say, okay, this person is really good. Or I really want this to give this person. But when I speak to them, they say, no, if, it's, if, if the job requires 10 things and a woman can do seven, she will tell me she's not ready. But if I say to a man, would you take this job? And he could do two things out of that 10, he's going to take it. So what am I supposed to do? And that is something that we as women, we have to be able to be very conscious of. So we have to be able to open ourselves to new opportunities and be willing to take the new opportunities and also saying that maybe we might need resources. So you might say, okay, you want me now to do this, whether it's a lateral move into a different area, whether it's a, a move into you know, a position on a board, but what kind of resources am I going to need? What are some of the kinds of things I'm going to do so that Mina, a banker, will go into the board and the energy sector? Those things are really important for you to be able to, because how else are you going to grow for yourself or how else are you going to learn? In Trinidad and Tobago's almost 61 year history of independence, we've only had one female prime minister. And during the time she was prime minister, I was on a panel, um, I think for International Women's Day, and we were talking about, about, you know, so different speakers talking about women and so on. And one of the speakers was saying that the prime minister, which I didn't even know, she said, you know, the, when the prime minister came into power, the state sector in, in Trinidad and Tobago has the most companies, right, the most corporates. And she said the prime minister was trying her best to get as many women into position as chair of, of a lot of the companies. But she found that every time she approached the woman, the woman would say, no, they wouldn't take, they can't take the chair that is outside their, 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 you know, their industry, their, their competence and so on. And on the table, the speaker's table, there's a woman sitting next to me and she sort of says to me, you know, she's very right. She said, I was offered to be chair of a company. Um, and it was a very small, it wasn't any sort of major significant company, not that it would really matter. And she said, I said, no, because I've never operated in that area before. And this woman sitting next to me is somebody who had like a double doctorate. I can't remember whether it was Harvard or Oxford or it was Harvard at Yale or something, but really sort of in the Ivy League school, double doctorates, right? And she said, and she said, I told her I would go in as, a, as a, um, an ordinary director, but I couldn't become a chair. So that we sometimes create barriers for ourselves and we need to learn how to break through those barriers. I want to just say something about the glass cliff, just, you know, it was mentioned and, and, you know, the glass cliff is that phenomenon that says that when organizations are failing or companies are in crisis, it's then jobs are handed to women. And as I talk about accepting new responsibilities and so on, I think as women, we need to be conscious about the glass cliff because what is going to happen is that you may be offered the position and I'm not saying don't take it, okay? A company's in crisis and a woman might bring certain kinds of skills depending on what the crisis is in terms of, you know, especially when there are large human resource implications. But what you have to be very careful about is that you make an assessment of what the risk is, you know, what is the risk of failure? You need to decide what resources will I need if I take this position? And you need, to, when you take the position, if you're in a corporate, you know, it might be something in your own office or it might be a position you are given by a government to do something that you record every success. So you mightn't end up in the end of the day, you know, getting 10 things done, but everything you get done. And the reason for this is if you do not do that, they put you in these positions, you take the position, the failure comes, and then they say, see, this is why women, women don't work. And, and so that when you are conscious of those things, you can't take the, what I call the glass cliff positions, but you have to take it with your eyes wide open. And, you know, I was involved in an organization, let me call it organization A, which was going through a crisis, which was affecting the stability of the organization. Organization B was a shareholder 
of organization B, A, and they were entitled to appoint, uh, um, to appoint some, uh, a director on the board. And of course, because the organization was in crisis, they appointed a woman. She came on the board. And two years later, when the crisis was over and the company had, the company had in fact um, started to turn over, organization B says to her, you have to come off that board because we want to put a man on instead. You know, and it, it just speaks to, well, it was a good ending to the story because um, that didn't happen. <laughs> it could happen, but it required understanding what was going on and actually being strategic about how you'd stop it from happening. But that's a whole other uh, point of discussion. And um, so another barrier that women face is that women are often perceived to lack ambition. And we kind of touched on it today. I think Mina talked about the fact that it's not that women lack ambition. Eh? Some of the things we talked about, like the home and the this and that and the other, that of those other barriers, in fact, affect what women are willing to do. But another woman, um, another problem that women have is that they don't brand, I think um, he called it branding yourself. They don't understand. I think Epstein, Sam, was it you, talked about the fact that we need to understand that we have to speak our value. A woman feels a look, if I am sitting down here and I am working so hard and you can see the work that I'm doing, then you have to know how good I am. Well, that is a complete fallacy. It does not work in organizations and it certainly does not work for you externally. You have to learn to build your, you know, to become visible, to build your visibility, both within the organization in which you're working and outside of the organization. And it is important for you too to understand, you might have an ex expertise in a particular area, but if you are sitting in the C-suite or you're sitting in the board, you must be willing to understand the business and to comment on other areas that are outside your area of expertise. You know, again, a woman will sit in a room and somebody will start talking about AI and they say, oh, well, I'm a techie person, let me stay out of that. They stay out of it, but in their head, they're saying, yeah, but what about this and what about that? But they would not put that on the table. And they're not putting it on the table because they figure I am not an expert in it. Whereas we all sit down and we see men putting in all kinds of things. And sometimes women say, but how you could even think about that? You know, there's an expression we use in Trinidad called tata, where somebody's really foolishness. And I've seen so many women sit in boardroom, boardrooms and say, but he's speaking so much tata. And I say, but then what are you saying? You know, and it's important for us to understand that we have to prove our value, not just by the work that we are doing, which is important, but we have to learn how to sell ourselves. And sometimes we are embarrassed to sell ourselves because we feel it is boasting. And, but the world, you know, drives itself on branding. And I'm not talking about just going out there and saying I'm the biggest and the baddest and the best in town. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying to learn to speak your value. I was in a cocktail party in St. Lucia, I think it was. And it was a business cocktail party. So in a business cocktail party, I suppose in every part of the world, but certainly in the Caribbean, it's like, okay, so what do you do? And people introduce themselves like that. So I am, somebody says, oh, so you are, so what do you do and so on? And I'm standing in this party. And of course, they usually those things are more men than women. And, but the men are like, you know, I'm a junk professor at this, but I've set up a company that is selling distressed assets and be doing things. And this is why I'm in the Caribbean and so on. And the woman, you know, two in particular, one says, well, in a little group, she says, well, you know, I'm in, I'm in the financial services. Now she's a CEO of an investment bank. It won't kill you to say that I am the CEO of this investment bank, which is the largest in the company or whatever. And another one said, she said, well, you know, I sell nails. And she's head of a, a company, a hundred, almost hundred year old company, hardware company that is the largest in the island. And that, you know, so that we think that self-deprecation might be funny, but when we talk about how do we get ourselves into leadership positions, how are we recognized, how are we think, we need to understand that we have to sell our brand. The same way Coca-Cola has to sell a brand is the same way Sharon Christopher has to learn how to sell a brand and bring that value that you have into the conversation. Another barrier that we face is that it is lonely at the top, right? Even now with so many women, so many more women and in every part of the world getting into positions of authority, they're still in the minority. 
And when you are promoted as a woman from amongst your peers and you are put into that position, you get a lot of pressure from other women because they want to see that you still remain one of them. It's a very interesting phenomenon. So then a woman faces a situation is, do I, am I now the boss? And how do I react in relation to that? Or are we still friends? Well, you know, ladies, your friends are outside the office. You know, they're not, I mean, you might have people you talked in the office and sort of spied, but you need to understand how your role starts to shift and how your role starts to change and how you need to stand up without being afraid of letting people understand, look, there are things that I need to be able to do now. Because what starts happening is that when the leadership team, which again, as I say, you mostly find is mostly men, when they start to see that you are still sort of, you know, trying to manage, let me put it that way, relationships that you had before, that starts to become a black mark against you. But then there's the other thing that I think, I can't remember who spoke about it this morning, and that is a lot of women fall into this queen bee syndrome. I am now appointed into this position. The truth is I have to work hell hard and sacrifice a lot to get here. I really don't want any other woman to come and, and take this piece of the pie that I have. And sometimes, again, it's unconscious. You're not even conscious of a bias within yourself towards other women and, and that you are now in this position of power. And so it becomes very important, again, for us to develop, you know, the self-awareness, to be able to conscious, be conscious of the behaviors that we are exhibiting. And, of course, to seek feedback from a trusted source, trusted source, of how are we behaving in the work environment? What do you think we are doing that we should not be doing? What does this start to look like? And then of course, if necessary, you find a coach to help you navigate the requirements of the position or you have your mentor or whatever it is and so on. But you have to be conscious of how it, you know, it's, it's not simple enough that I'm put in a position of power. We soon start to realize that we thought that that was the end game, but it's really only the beginning of something else. And sometimes you need help to be able to navigate that, right? And the final thing I want to talk about is that sort of has to do with everything is that how women are held to a higher standard than men. They are. Again, I keep calling out my Caribbean system, but I have to say, you know, Mina spoke about the fact that you get on a board and you see the energy sector and you spend hours making sure you have everything right because you know when you go into that boardroom, especially if you're the first woman coming into that board or the only woman sitting on that board, you have to be very clear on making your voice heard and be very clear on what you're saying and be very clear on, on understanding what, what is going on. And sometimes because women are held to the standard and because they're under a microscope, women feel, you know, I really do not know this. It becomes a huge barrier because it's like everything I say and everything I do you know, people are looking at me. And we see it, it's not only in the boardroom, we see it in people like Kamala Harris as vice president of, 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 of the United States. We see it, you know, Jacinda Ardern as prime minister in, in New Zealand. You know, it's it's like, it's a constant things that people would, people, men and women will just get away from. You finally get away with, sorry, you find yourself in a position in which it's not so easy for you. And then you become very defensive around your position now because you feel every single thing that somebody tells you, every piece of criticism, it means, okay, well, you know, I'm really not good. So therefore you react in certain manners and then people start to see your behavior is becoming dysfunctional. And you need to sort of be able again to be conscious to sit back to understand that in anything we're gonna make mistakes and every mistake is a learning experience. You have to learn not to take things personally. Now, it's true that we say yes because you're a woman, but you know, the point about it, you can't be fighting every battle. It may be because you're a woman, this is happening, and there are microaggressions that everybody in life has faced because there are so many prejudices around everything from race, religion, culture, country, all those things. You cannot react to everything. You have to learn to conserve your energy for what really matters. You have to, for yourself, to remind yourself every day about the strengths that you have and not your weaknesses. You know, when I was, when I was a, a litigation, when I was in litigation, you know, we'd go into court, I worked with the government, and we'd do all these very high profile cases in Trinidad, and you're in court and you're arguing all the time. About maybe 
10, 15 years after I came out of litigation, the attorney general who had been our boss at that time, who was attorney general at that time, called all his lawyers together just for, you know, us getting together to talk about what we're doing now and so on. And I used to work with a particular male, um, a male colleague, uh, another lawyer. And he started talking about, you remember, Sharon, all these cases that we won and all these this and he's going on. I'm like, I can't even remember those cases, but you asked me about every mistake I made in court, I could roll it out for you. And, and, it, and it was such a wake up call for me because I never think of those things. I think of witness turning hostile with me. I think of quoting a wrong precedent, I, you know, all kinds of things. And so we need to understand that maybe sometimes we don't do things right. Yeah, we make mistakes, but it's all right. We make it and we learn. The only problem is if you keep making the same mistake and not learning from it, then you have another issue, but we have to. So what I always say to women is we have to learn more than anything else to be kind to ourselves. We need to be kind to ourselves. So, you know, I'll stop here and just say, you know, there are barriers and the issue is not what are the barriers. The issue is always is what are we going to do about it? And you know, a six year old, knew that Martin Luther King had done his part and now she had to do hers six years old and she changed the course of history. What are you telling yourself? So I would stop there. Wow. Sharon, thank you so much. Oh my God, this was just so awesome. And I have to tell you, Sharon, my phone has been lit by messages from around the Caribbean region here who are so motivated and so inspired by what you have shared. So I can't thank you enough. As you said, these are six barriers that you identified. There are many more, but these six barriers were so common. I could have related to so many of them. So I really appreciate what you have shared here. Now we are at 1047, which means we are minutes away from what is meant to be our um our close time today and i know that we needed to get back to some of those questions from the panel discussion mm -hmm. so i would like to ask uh noor can we have all of the the um can we have the the, the moderator rejoin us so that's uh, francesca and if our panelists are there let's keep sharon on and the other panelists and so for the remaining minutes if you want to address any of the questions, I know there are several, but maybe you could take one or two key questions um, that we can have. So we, we ensure that we engage as much as we can in the time that is left with us. So is uh, Francesca, yes. Yes, I'm here, Pamela. Yeah, so there are many, so I'm trying to pick it up and then please, you know, if if I also ask some, some help to, the fellow colleagues and the, the panelists. There is one specific I see just in front of me for specifically for Mina um, regarding um, the, uh, whether she, you know, if, if she sits in the boards for public company, how did they navigate the political landscape, uh, meaning political expectation when carrying out your role in Jamaica? from presentation, just recovering from Sharon's fantastic presentation. Thanks, Sharon. Um, well, I, a number of points have been um, highlighted earlier, and maybe I'll just, uh, in the interest of time, just remind ourselves some of the things that we should do. Um, too often you go into a board meeting and you know some of the guys have not read the board papers. Isn't that true, ladies? You spent all night, all weekend preparing for that board meeting. And when you look, so what I do now, I said, I'll take that as read. Any questions, please? <laughs> but really the important thing is to make sure you are prepared. You are, you make the time commitment to prepare for the meeting, but also for the boards you sit on. I mentioned earlier, I've retired from corporate life. I sit on seven boards. And it's a lot of work if you do it well. And then you become known in the industry. In Jamaica, it's a pretty small economy. Everybody knows everybody. So I was sought after because of my skills. But I think where we're going now is that we have to look at 
headhunters. You know, find one, tell them what you want to do, which board you want to sit on, and let them help you navigate your way to that board. I think that's where it is in the first world. And in, in, in the region, the Caribbean region, this is where I think we're going next. Because I see that happening. I've received the calls from headhunters who are looking for the skills to fill that, that box. So I think this is something that we should all um, consider. And to start, to gain your confidence, offer your services to not-for-profit organizations, business associate, associations, chamber of commerce, um, as Rowena um, shared. Keep up with the trends, you know. As I say, ask the right question. Know your duties and responsibilities. Too often, we women are criticized for going too deep for really going on the path of management versus a board director. It's a distinct, different responsibilities and duties. Be strategic, be prepared, commit the time, and, uh, and, and just get to know the industries and the regulatory environment that you, you serve on. Be accountable and manage and force the board, hold the board accountable and also the management to compliance. Thanks a lot, Nina. Thanks a lot. So very insightful. Probably go. I, I pick another question, and this is some um, Excellency Abdulatif. Maybe you can help me on answer this, which is about uh, men supporting the growth of female leaders, and actually about unconscious bias that you have mentioned as one of the key elements that we need to, you know, uh, recognize and also to work on. So. The question is, is there, is there any advice on how to help male unlearn biases about women in technical environments? Uh, help men uh, learn uh, to unbias. I, I, you know, I think what needs, what needs to be done is uh, to help organizations uh, become debiased. Uh, uh, by that, uh, what needs to be done is uh, we promote, uh, for instance, uh, organizations to have a policy about advancement and promotion of females and leadership and, and boards uh, by uh, promoting more objectivity in the nomination process for uh, leading positions and, and the nomination committees of boards to be more inclusive uh, in that. That's to me. That's what needs to be done. Um, like I indicated, what we need you will get much more return on investment by putting our energy on the institutional capacity building and on making things institutional and working by, on debiasing organizations rather than just the individuals. Individuals do come and go. Uh, so to me, that's, that's really what needs to be done. And I think it is far more effective than trying to, while you still should work on individuals, especially you know, chairmen and chairpersons of leading institutions, regulators and all that. But really, really, I think you get much more return on investment by debiasing organizations rather than uh, debiasing individuals. You are definitely right, Mr. Abdulatid. And, and I think this is remind me also one research that we did uh, recently on the culture makers that are actually a group of leaders in an organization that also that really drive the changes. So they say they do and they drive. So, but those are actually, you know, they're making the change in the organization, which is actually what, what is needed because then if it's lined only with some individual, it's not gonna, you know, make the changes that are needed. So no, thanks a lot. And, um, and then so I, I would add, uh, sorry. And then I would add that, you know, success sure. breeds success. Uh, if you work with one or two organizations or individuals and demonstrate and seeing is believing, it will become, you know, like a tipping point and it becomes exponential. Definitely, definitely. And multiply factors, that's true. 
Okay, so I think um, Jane and Carla, I will give it back to you for the closing remarks so we can be mostly on time, I would say. So thanks a lot, thanks again. Uh, thanks, thanks for, it has been amazing, all the, uh, the, 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 all the speakers and everyone. And back to you for the closing remark. Thank you very much, uh, Francesca. Uh, Jane, we do have a few minutes still, and, and it would be wonderful if we can hear from uh, Professor Garrett. Um, so, uh, Professor Garrett, I, I just want to um, check in with you um, and see if you'd like to share a few words with us before we wrap up for today. Okay. Uh, well, many thanks. And that was wonderful. <clears throat> I got a lot out of that. Thank you, everybody, for, for that. That, that. That was really uh, inspiring. Um, yeah, first of all, apologies. I have no idea, technically, why I couldn't uh, try. I tried three different routes to get to log in. None of them worked, but eventually I found it, which is why I'm wearing these old headphones at the moment. It's, I had to go back to primitive technology to make it work. Um, uh, yeah, I'm... Um, I'm writing a book at the moment. I nearly finished it. Its title is um, uh, A Speech by a Woman in Shakespeare's uh, Merchant of Venice. Uh, the woman is uh, the lawyer, Portia. And uh, at one point, she's locked up. She's trapped and feeling very, very constrained in a very dark room and has one small candle with her. And uh, she lights a candle and then says, she, she is astonished by the amount of light a single candle actually generates. Um, <clears throat> and she says, ah, shining a light on a naughty world. And that's the title of the book. Um, and it's very, uh, it, but the subtitle is exploring four levels of bored maturity. And I think it reflects a lot on what you've just been saying, not just about are women on and off the board, but the question is, what is the maturity level of every individual on that board and of the total board? And there's a whole lot of stuff there where you can bring in very mature women who then have a really bad time if you've got a very immature board. So um, that, that's where I'm um, trying to get people to get in thinking about the possibility of four levels of that. And I've been writing that book. I've been astonished by the over two years during COVID, by the support I've had from um, women, really quite amazing. And if we go back to what Clude was saying at the beginning and what others have said during this session, um, uh, the amount of passion that I find coming out now, driving forward the whole issue of board effectiveness um, seems to be coming, in my experience anyway, mainly from women at the moment. There, there are some men who are doing a, an excellent job, but the intellectual drive, but especially the passion and the emotional drive seems to be coming out of women. And I, there are 14 of them. I've been um, having very deep and continuous conversations with over these last two years. Just to give you a, a sort of clue, Jill Atkins uh, and uh, Liz Barber in uh, the UK, Janice Kaplan in um, Italy, Ronel Dathun Baird we know on this circuit from Barbados, Karen Chalmers we know from South Africa, a very wise woman, uh, Denise uh, Fleming, um, an old woman in Australia, very bright young rising star, uh, Victoria Hearth, who is now going to take over centre in Cambridge, Coral Ingley in New Zealand, Kate Jolly in Scotland, Alexandra Gladue in the US, Corey Palmer in Wales, Kamla, of course, in, uh, in Trinidad, uh, Natalie Romain in France, Tina Suendu in South Africa, Jane, of course, in uh, Dubai, and Charlotte Valour in Jersey and Denmark. I mean, they, they have really put some energy into the discussions with me. And that, that's just 14 countries and a group of women. But there are a lot of people behind them. One of the things I want to stress is it's not just about getting a woman onto a board. It's actually you've got a huge, passionate and intellectual uh, force now internationally that actually will allow women to drive forward, not just to be 
directors, but to actually shape the future of what a director will be. So I, I slightly jokingly with these uh, women I've mentioned, call them the scene shifters. They are moving the scenery and they are redefining the context in which a lot of the plays now occur. And I'm all for it. And I think uh, we're going to see a lot more of this as we go into the future. Um, two quick comments then, slightly different from those. One, I think we are now getting to a stage intellectually where we are moving well beyond ESG. And ESG has been very much a, uh, a topic for the last few years and is still uh, developing in many parts of the world. But I think we're going beyond that now, beginning to um, do something I've argued about for a long time, which is we're beginning to now add proper systems thinking into board work. And this whole issue of how do you develop a board as a thinking system and a learning system is actually beginning to get some hard edges to it now. Before, rather like ESG and like CSR before it, it's a really nice to have but there was not sufficient hard edge to it to grab people. But I think it is beginning to occur now. And um, I, I see it coming through. Um, and this is where some people think I'm slightly nuts, but you have to remember that I was trained originally in architecture. So I tend to think in pictures as well as uh, in words. And I'm interested in the pictures that are emerging. Back in the 70s, we often talked about stable state economies and stable state businesses and even stable state boards. And the idea was that there was sufficient um, energy and resource within whatever existed to allow it to be recirculated and to re maintain that stable state. Now, that thinking is, um, is not around at the moment. However, a lot of people still think that way, but use the term the circular economy. But a lot of what I see as a circular economy is not. It's still a very hard, hard edge, simplistic, um, stable state economy. And so how do we move forward from that? And I'm arguing, and this is where the pictures come in, that we're looking for some sort of um, progression that involves circles and movement. So we can build on the circular economy, but we need to go forward. Um, one way of doing that, if you think about it, is in the system thinking terms, you actually complete a complete circle. The problem with completing a circle is you come back to the beginning. And that's not where I want to be, I want to move on. And so what symbols then can we begin to look at that? Now we've actually used this and we've used this certainly with Jane and certainly with Kamla in the idea of the double loop of learning, that figure of eight, usually on its side, mathematically a lemnis skate. But that notion of the double loop that involves on the one hand operations, on the other hand strategy, and the board spanning those two, is I think um, coming into greater focus now if we apply some systems thinking to that. Um, and you can go further, um, you can turn that into a Mobius strip, but um, I won't go into those details. And there's some mathematicians at the right moment, particularly Hofstadter, who's talking about, would you believe square loops? But I won't go into that either at the moment, because frankly, I don't understand it either, but it looks interesting. What I will say though, is rather than just having that revolution and really returning to the same, why don't we think in three dimensions, which is what architects do, and think of spirals. And if you think about, if we're moving on, then we're moving up one pitch of a spiral. And that is progression, and that is development. And I'm not quite sure how I'm going to explain all this at the moment, so I won't even attempt it, but I'm looking at spirals. And then I got very excited a couple of nights ago when I was thinking, well, if you're thinking about spirals, and what does a spiral mean in terms of board development and organizational development? I suddenly realized that I was actually thinking of double helixes, the basis of life, of growth, of living, of organizations as living forms is the double helix. So at the moment, I'm completely baffling myself, but I'm thinking about double helixes. Thank you. <laughs>